Hi everybody, today is the two year anniversary of Death Gambit Afterlife. And to commemorate that, I decided that I want to make a uh, playthrough video where I play through the game and uh, just kind of go over some of the development stories about each area and each level one by one. Uh, this is probably be a really long playthrough because it's a long game, and uh, but I hope that uh, if you're a hardcore fan that you'll stick through it to the end and you learn something new. Um, before I go into uh, the actual playthrough, uh, I did want to mention that uh, I will be talking about a lot of cut content and content that changed, and uh, I think this is the case for pretty much every video game, uh, but just because I just because there was something that was cut, that doesn't mean that it was cut because we were lazy, because we were being cheap or anything like that. Uh, pretty much most of the times when things changed or got cut, it's because the idea was not very good. Uh, that or it was because I was not a very good programmer at the time or a good designer. I started making this game when I was 18 years old. It was that Gambit Afterlife was a huge learning process for me. Um, and by the end, that Gambit Afterlife is a game that I'm really proud of, but um, it went through a lot of trials and tribulations. I think uh, that is something that is well documented about the, the development of this game. Um, but anyways, I just wanted to, to talk about that. Um, anyways, uh, I hope you all enjoy the playthrough. Um, and before I start, I wanted to also show this crazy statue. I don't think a lot of people know <laughs> that we made this thing. There's only about 10 of them in the world. Um, some of them got sent to like some contest winners uh, when the original That's Gambit released. Some of them are in the hands of some streamers. Um, but anyways, it's so cool. I just wanted to show it. Uh, that scythe is a little small, but <laughs> otherwise it's, uh, it's amazing. It's like a working hourglass. Anyways, I don't know. I don't want to ramble too much. Let's get started with this video. Right off the bat with the intro scenes. Um, in case I sound different, uh, it's because I have a new mic, which I bought for the purpose of this playthrough. Hopefully the volume of the music and my voice is correct. If not, I apologize. There will probably be a lot of hitches with this. I don't usually record videos um, or playthroughs for that matter. Anyways, um, so right off the bat, the first thing I want to say about this intro is that the music was sort of inspired by a song in the game Terra Enigma from for the SNES. I honestly can't remember the name of the song, uh, but me and Kyle were trying to find something uh, or inspirations from stuff that sounded correct uh, or that matched the feeling of the scenes that are playing right now. Um, I'm super happy with how the art turned out here. Alex Kubudera uh, did an amazing job. It's so cool. Alex is the uh, art director on the game and also was design director with me. I was the programming director. I am John Canellas. <laughs> I think I mentioned that before in the video, but I'll mention it again just in case. Throughout the soundtrack, there, there are also many other inspirations that I will be mentioning, but uh, Princess Mononoke, Attack on Titan, Dark Souls uh, are big inspirations for the music. Anything by uh, Sawano, the composer of Attack on Titan and, and a few other shows is, is a big inspiration for us, at least on, on this game. I'm gonna create a new character. I'll be playing mouse and keyboard today. Not gonna lie, I play tested the game way too much mouse and keyboard. I should have done more gamepad and keyboard only. Um, would have probably found bugs faster if I had done that more often. I did, but not enough. Um, right off the bat, I knew I wanted to throw people for a loop by showing something very sci-fi. Um, something that would... Uh, make more sense near the end of the game so the game feels like it comes full circle a little bit um which is interesting because the original well there's so many versions of death's gambit and the final version that you're playing here today is so different from the other versions uh, that we had in mind um i'm very happy with this version but i remember there was a original version which I, I I think Alex disagreed with me, so we didn't do it. 
I'll let Thamos finish talking. Okay. I just can't tell if his voice is louder than mine. It's very loud on my end. Um, but I'm here to help you remember. So everything is going to be alright. Thomas is I think one of the best characters that we made. Very proud of him. Um what was I saying? Oh yeah, the original intro for the game, I believe, had death talking with Thomas at like a she like while they were playing chess and they had like they were effectively like pondering a philosophical question and one of them wanted they wanted to test whether who was right um about that philosophical question about life and death um and so the whole game was going to be uh as a result of them trying to see uh if their theory was right or wrong um that's not what happens now in the game <laughs> uh and th death and thalmas are not at all buddies or or interact at all um through the story but they did in that iteration and i thought that was cool and i wanted to mention it um depending what class i pick this playthrough will go very differently i I won't lie, my favorite is probably the wizard. I am very proud of how the magic system turned out. But I think for the sake of this playthrough being as simple as possible or as generic as possible to... I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that. I'll just play the soldier. I'll try messing around with other weapons, though. Um, uh... I'm also very happy with how this intro turned out where you get to like kind of practice and, and try out different classes before you uh, start your playthrough. I believe uh, I was inspired by Neo 2 because I believe in Neo 2 you can do that. You can just test out a bunch of stuff at the beginning of the game before you start out. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. Like that's perfect for souls. Like that has to be how the game begins. And so that was part of the original uh, idea for this area. Uh, although, I also knew that I wanted Thalmas to talk here uh, to kind of... I kind of felt that the game needed a better intro, something to hook you. And if you hear this really creepy voice at the beginning of the game talking to you, then you're immediately going to be kind of uh, curious and, and want to know what the heck is happening. Meanwhile, in the original game, Thalmas kind of comes in 70% of the way through the game, maybe. Which is like, after you get to that part, you're hooked. You kind of want to know what happens next. But I felt like if you knew that that was coming at the beginning or something crazy was coming, that this game was going to be really weird and meta right from the start, then people will probably be more likely to stay along for the ride, no matter how hard the game is. And I think that was a fantastic choice uh, because it, it's so cool. I think it's uh, keeps the mystery or it starts uh, introducing the mystery right away. Uh, so uh, fantastic hook. In my honest opinion, let's continue like this. Now tell me, which of these mementos do you feel a connection to? Obviously, I loved how Dark Souls lets you pick like a random item at the beginning of the game. These these are not balanced at all. I just wanted to put some silly stuff here. Um, if you were to pick something, probably the best thing would probably be. The crystals, the shield, I think is very underrated, especially for fights like Endless Heroic, um, since it uh, reduces the time that the debuffs she puts on you uh, last. Um, actually, this would probably be the best, but since I want to mess around with weapons, I don't know how much I'll be able to, uh, I'll, I'll pick the spear. Um, I don't know how... F if this will be a completely full playthrough, I don't think I'll be playing through all the heroics or anything. Um, but uh, I will try to be as thorough as possible so I can tell you as many tidbits of development. I don't think this was a little bit... I don't think this was implemented amazingly. I I think as you own Ashes of Vados... Um, and you hadn't played the game yet, some players might start out selecting one of these modes on their first playthrough, which I don't think is the best way 
to do your first playthrough um maybe we should have put something that like tells you to highly recommend that you select no traits for your first playthrough do you want to make things even worse now then we return to the point of no return your <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I think we tried to put this scene uh, like like, a, like as a scene where you can control Soren and the horse. Um, like it was originally going to be where Soren can ride the horse in the intro and fight people on horseback and then death kills you. I mean, um, endless kills you. <laughs> but it was really unfun. Subtle waste of soul energy. And if the game begins with something so unfun, then I, then yeah, that would have been terrible. Give you another chance, a deal, or I may have to lower the voice overs on my end because I can barely talk, but that's where or I can barely hear my own voice over Thomas's voice right now. You will go on to do great. I'll go ahead and lower that after this uh, setup cutscenes. But this intro that's coming up uh, was animated by the same studio who did um, one of our one of our last trailers uh, for the original that scam bit, and we were so happy with it, um, and it was received so well that we asked them to do an intro for us uh, for Afterlife. Or, before I had made that intro with Thalmas talking to you, this was going to be the original first intro for Afterlife. Endless is so cool. It's, it's funny because Endless is a design was probably the most like I would say it's one of the least creative designs that we have in terms of like we just tried to mash as many cool aspects into one character like let's just give her white hair and a long sword um like <laughs> like I think originally I wanted the sword to be as long as Sephiroth's and it like covered like half the screen um and there are animations where it is huge in the game um for no reason I believe, like her ultimate attack uh, at the beginning of the heroic uh, fight, she does that. Anyways, um, Rel, also a fantastic design. A One of the first characters we made. I don't think Rel, Rel went through many character design changes. We kind of knew what he was going to be right from the start. He's effectively the, I believe that his name is a crestfallen soldier from Dark Souls 1. So basically he's supposed to be like the character that tells you to give up <laughs> at the beginning of the game. Uh, which every, which every Souls like sort of has one. Maybe not Elden Ring, but I, I remember Demon Souls and Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2 always has like a character that right off the gate tells you to give up and that you suck. Um, but we wanted to give Vrel a more important, uh, part of the plot like we wanted him to have more personality and 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 have more importance in the story than just being like one guy obviously else it would have just been a copy paste from dark souls one um anyways i'll continue uh okay i'm gonna lower the voices a tad a little bit i'm just gonna lower it all actually the volume uh, sliders are could be better. <laughs> Won't lie. A lot of the UI could be better. Alright. Better be used to it. You remember our deal, don't you? 
This song is so Attack on Titan. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It feels lifted almost. I feel bad. In return, you must do. Give it time. For now, just sign here. In love, of course. It'll take you some time to refamiliarize yourself until you. Um. Cool. There's so much more I could say. I mean, like, I don't want this playthrough to take forever, so I'll just start playing. But there's a lot that can be said about the art here and how much it changed and how this is originally the main menu of the game. And I honestly didn't like it too much, but I can see how some people enjoyed it. And, uh, yeah, there was a lot of people who asked for us to be able to to reset the menu to the original game's main menu. So we added that option in the options. I'm glad people like that the main menu changes as you progress through the game. That was something I was really proud of and happy that we did. Uh, once you get to Ilnoth, the main menu changes. It always made me laugh how much everyone immediately wants to get this item. Um, <laughs> there's something fun about immediately putting something out of reach so that you want to go back for it. Um... These are gravestones. Originally, these were not designed to be like notes uh, that were used as a tutorial. These were originally the... We were originally going to have online elements where you would be able to put tips for other players. Um, we never did that because I'm not very good at multiplayer um, network coding. I consider myself more of a designer, really. Um, and the game was already insanely ambitious for such a small team. Like, we were, like, three people. Like, <laughs> I, I, we did hire a network engineer that was part-time for a little bit. And we did have it sort of working. But just the idea of getting it working both on PC and console, it was just, like, the combination of doing both console and PC networking, like, everything. It was just too much. I was already working, like, 80 hours a week. This, uh, I couldn't. I couldn't be asked. I apologize that it's not in the final game. Um... And for the record, I think I mentioned it before, but I never asked anyone else to uh, work more than 40 hours a week. Uh, I was the only one who I felt like I needed to because I was a director. Now I don't, you know, do that because it was so, it was such a huge sacrifice, honestly. Like, when you game dev for that long, like, the rest of your life takes a big toll. So I'm super happy that uh, my life is a lot more balanced now. Just, uh, just putting it out there. I am feeling great. Uh, so yeah. I, I feel like a lot of people end up quitting game development. Because they work too hard. And somehow I stuck through it. And it's thankfully way better now. I enjoy game development once again. Even after I was burned out. <laughs> Continuing. Let's continue. Uh... This, we, I obviously wanted to put an enemy that was really hard from the get-go, kind of inspired by, like, the werewolf in Bloodborne that immediately attacks you. Um, but obviously, since you have to defeat this guy, he can't be as hard as that, or as hard as the um, boss that fights you, the, the boss that fights you at the beginning of Dark Souls 1. Uh, oh my god, I'm forgetting his name. The Asylum Demon. Um... This area was very different the first time around. I will explain in a sec. Uh, this this Moss Knight was the first enemy every time, like in every iteration to my knowledge, but um, from what I remember. But originally this area was way more linear. I am so happy that we didn't do that. Uh, this area is so cool now that it's like gives you options to go left or right after this section. Uh, it also, I also want to be, I also want to mention that this was not the first area we made. Uh, the first area we developed and designed and programmed was the Obsidian Veil. And the original iteration is is not what is the final product, what you see in the final product of Death's Gambit. And it was um, what we showed to publishers um, when we were pitching this game. 
it helped us so much to pitch to publishers uh, to have them see that we had a full level and a full boss fight against the Tundra Lord already ready to go before they even uh, funded our game. So that helped us um, with our pitches. I don't know how much more I can say uh, about pitching <laughs> this game without running into problems, so I won't say much more. But um, but I'll just say that it went very, very well. Especially, I believe, probably because Dark Souls was all the rage back then. Now there's a lot of other Souls likes, but we were some of the first. Like uh, us and Solon Sanctuary uh, were some of the first Souls likes out there. Um, besides Dark Souls. And I just want to be clear, I, I had already started designing in my head this game when it was Demon Souls. Uh, when, when Demon Souls had just come out. Um, I, I was obsessed with that game. So, and I knew, I somehow felt that in, in the bot, like, I, I somehow knew that that would be sort of the future of video games, that that would, like, spawn a whole genre, because it was so good. Um, I'm glad that there are so many more now. And I wish I had more time to play all of them. Um... And I'd like to add, since I mentioned Solemn Sanctuary, that um, the original Solemn Sanctuary, I haven't played the second one, um, but the original had such a fantastic core loop, an addictive core loop to it, that um, that, that was part of the inspiration for adding talent po more talent points to the game. It was just because I felt like that was part of the reason that game was so addictive, was because you wanted to kind of like progress your character and see what else you are going to get. Um, and so now I feel like Death's Gambit kind of has that same addictive quality. The original Death's Gambit did not have that. That said, uh, I don't think that makes it a worse game because of it. It's, it was the game I wanted to make at the time, um, excluding the bugs of the original release, um, which I will go into a little bit more later. Because um, that's obviously something I will probably have to bring up if I'm doing a full playthrough. It was the original release. I I feel like we sh if we had more time we would have implemented the bow to be better. I think I have a lot of things that I regret about how we implemented the bow, but whatever. Small team, I guess. It's actually insane how much we were to make, how much how huge this game is um, for such a small team. Like we were three people for the most part. Um, and it has like 20 areas and it's like one of the largest metrovania maps in, in the whole world like i feel like not enough people like bring it up it's like <laughs> this is an Im immense metrovania world i'm glad that uh people consider this game a, a hidden gem i see that very often um so in that sense i'm i'm glad and happy with the reception of the game but um yeah, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Uh, very basic tutorial for Soul Energy. It's a little bit rough. As a game designer, I, I should probably not complain so much about my own game. But that is what we do. I made it, so I know all of its flaws. Um... Yeah, so the original iteration of this area was way more linear. Um, and I believe the original boss for this area was going to be uh, the Forgotten Gaian. And uh, it was just... And Ioni. Um, but it just felt way too hard for the first boss. And it just felt like also it's so bombastic and so like epic that if that's how we start the game, like how are we going to build it up any further? Like... <laughs> The next, like, ten bosses are not even close to as epic and huge um, as that one. So it kind of makes sense that we uh, we did not go with that as the first boss. Um, we then afterwards tried the Dark Knight as the first boss, um, which you may laugh hearing that. Yes, the Dark Knight is insanely hard as the first boss, but it was a toned down Dark Knight that was easier. Um, but even then, it was still too hard. The animations were really complicated for our first boss. and. Um, I ended up deciding on the Owl King mostly because I just 
love the animations of that anime. Uh, it was originally made for the ob Observatory, for Mulder's Observatory. And um, the animations turned out so amazing that... Uh, and so, I guess the best way to put it is they're easy to, to tell what he's going to do. They're well telegraphed. Um, and it just turned out great. So, I was like, let's make this the first boss. Um, the animations are really cool. The, the creature design is cool. Um, so, after like trying to make Forgotten Guy and the Dark Knight the first boss, we put an Owl King there, and that felt really good. Um, it kind of doesn't make sense, lore-wise. Like, why is there an Owl King here? I mean... Uh, because this area is like very Gaian themed that you'd imagine it would have a Gaian boss. Um, but uh, I guess you could say that the Owl King kind of teleported from a Wolverine's Observatory. At the end of the day, they can teleport around, so it's, it can make sense lore wise, you know? Um, but uh, but yeah. Um, and, and also, I'd, uh, so, so speaking of Gaians and the inspiration for this area. It was very Princess Mononoke inspired, this area. Uh, the music as well. Um, it was, I believe, like the fourth area we worked on and made. Um, because originally, the original game didn't have any Princess Mononoke inspiration at all. It was just like a sci-fi game. The first areas that we had, in, the only areas that we had in mind were uh, Guarded Tomb, uh, Obsidian Veil, vale, uh, the Immortal Citadel, and we knew, or like I knew I wanted Thalamus. I knew I wanted like, I wanted that idea of a evil entity in the game um, as, as like the secret antagonist uh, that wouldn't be the final boss. Um, and the Immortal Citadel was originally gonna be like most of the game. Like it was gonna be this huge giant tower levels and bosses. Um, it was like the rest of the game was like a tutorial and then the Moral Citadel is when shit gets hard, you know? <laughs> um, but I eventually wanted to make more areas and so the Moral Citadel ended up being a, just one level and uh, Alduin, Alduin wasn't even an idea in our head because we didn't want to make it that Dark Soulsy. Originally we wanted it to be very different. Hilariously, Alduin was conceived because we wanted people to think it was a Dark Souls game. We wanted people to think like, oh, there's gonna be a souls like, like, oh, medieval city, like, I get this, this makes sense. Um, I'll play that. And so the idea would be that people would see Alduin and be like, okay, I'm sold. And then when they play the game, they notice that there's way more to it. And there's like the sci-fi area and this like Ilnoth, like underwater city area and they just get their minds blown and that was the idea. Um, but hilariously, a lot of people were like, seeing the promo images of Alduin and being like, wow, this is just a ripoff of Dark Souls. Like, it's just medieval, uh, black, uh, I don't know how to put it, like medieval dark fantasy. Um, like, I don't want to play another dark fantasy game. So it was kind of frustrating <laughs> because like some players were not playing it because they thought the whole game was like Alduin when actually it's, it's got so many different cool areas, as you all may know. Um, very happy with this entire area. It's one of my favorite designs. I, I feel so proud of uh, Gaian's Cradle. The game design here is is very good. I'm proud of it. Um, and this scene is so cool too. I, I'm i glad we got to introduce Endless so early. I, I knew that right off the bat I wanted to throw some cool ideas of cool mechanics right off the gate. And so one cool thing about this fight is that if you lose and you come back, the characters say something else um, when you come in, like, why aren't you dead? And I just I just wanted to do a lot of that to keep the player uh, interested in the game. Um, that's that's a whole pacing thing. I, I really care about pacing. Um, by that, I mean, like, I want the player to not get bored. Like. If you die, you'll come back and see a new cutscene. Like I, that's part of why that's there is to keep you interested, to make you not quit the game. <laughs> but also because it's just cool. There are many things here that I had that we wanted to do that were unique to, to games. Um, many mechanics we couldn't even we couldn't put in the final project that would have been unique. Um, I'll, I'll talk about them in a sec. But there's many mechanics that. 
didn't make it into the final product that I wish we had uh, been able to do them because they were very hard, but I had never seen games do stuff like that. Especially one with the sniper boss, and I'll go into that when I get to the sniper boss, but it is something I had never seen done before in games. I can't believe I have still the muscle memory for every attack. I hope you guys know that I have completed this game probably like 200 times. Because it was such a small team, I would have to playtest it all myself. I know that sounds like the definition of insanity, but yeah. And, and, I, and I also want to be clear, I'm not the only playtester. We had a full playtesting team at, um, at Adult Swim and with Serenity Forge. Um, so I was not the only playtester. Um, obviously, Alex and other team members playtested as well. But I had to do a lot, too. Really happy with how the portraits ended up. Alex did a great job. Of course it is, Soren. Don't worry, my boy. I'll be back before you know it. Here. Take this. <laughs> Don't burn down the house while I'm gone. I find it funny that most of the characters are pixel animated, but the horse is like animated with spine. Spine, Spine is a program that we use to animate a lot of the bigger bosses like Kusith and the Forgotten Gaian. Because if it was pixel animated, then it would crash the game because it's way too much art, way too much texture memory would be used and the game would just crash. Um, but um, I'm not sure how I feel about Spine animations on the final, on this game. Uh, the original Death Gambit had way more Spine animations. Um... And for Afterlife, we realized that mostly just the giant bosses should have spine animation because we had to. Otherwise, they wouldn't work. Um, but otherwise, I prefer just hand-drawn pixel animation. I think most people agree that it looks better. But somehow the horse ended up really good, <laughs> so we kept it. Um, the horse turning animation is so smooth and so good. Uh, Greg, one of our animators, did an amazing job. Um, We've over the course of the development, we had many amazing animators, uh, about about five or six of them, in fact. Uh, Greg was one of them that was there most of the time, including uh, Brian. Brian did Endless and The Dark Knight and uh, Thalmas. Greg did, uh, I believe, Forgotten Gain and Bulwark and a few others. Uh, well, he did a lot actually. <laughs> uh, at this point, it's been so long, I kind of forget who did what, but Greg did a lot. Um, I think the hitbox I think is a little bit finicky. On his stabbing animation, but whatever. I guess. Um... Cool. I don't know if there's anything else I'd like to say right off the bat about Gaian's Cradle. Um, it was originally way more linear and it went through like four completely different iterations until it became what it was. Originally being much longer and having more tutorials, I believe. Uh, yeah, I'll continue. There's so much more that could be said and if I remember it, I'll add it to the video. Those enemies are purely there to teach you that you can run over enemies. Um, I I really wanted this area to have like so many like little things to make you go like, oh man, I have to go back. Um, so that you would go back. Um, this is the part where it becomes a, a true Metroidvania. But the original game was not as much of a Metroidvania and that was on purpose. I wanted to be more Dark Souls-y and have less like movement upgrades and, and just be a very focused hack and slash experience. Um, but uh, I think at a certain point we realized that players wanted that stuff and that it made the game funner to have like double jump and like stuff like that. So for Afterlife, we decided to add them because of that. 
I, I think in a lot of interviews we've explained that. Uh, that the Metroidvania aspects were something we really wanted to do with Afterlife, or like expand upon them. Partly, that's partly why we added a map. Besides the fact that the game was just getting so big. Uh, okay. Okay. You know the thing they say that some developers are terrible at playing video games? I think for the most part that's correct, but it's definitely not the case for me. <laughs> and it led me to create some absolutely fiendishly difficult bosses for the original game. And yeah. Believe it or not, Heroic Endless was possibly like five times more insane and hard for the original game and then we had some people uh try to make a guide for the game <laughs> for the original that's gambit and they were like what is this <laughs> when they fought heroic endless um and that made me tone it down and uh, which sounds insane right because as you all know heroic endless is one of the hardest fights in the entire game taking people hundreds of attempts um but back in the day i was a very I don't know, an experienced game developer. And I sort of assumed that players would be better than me at the game. And I was wrong. <laughs> I was sort of equal on equal grounds on some of the better players of the game. Which made me realize that uh, I shouldn't make anything... Uh, anything even optional. Even the optional bosses shouldn't be... Uh, something that's like incredibly hard for me. I love this song so much. The Central Sanctuary also changed dramatically. I We had so many iterations of what this area would look like. Um, and it was honestly much bigger before, encompassing like potentially two to three different areas. But it wasn't well structured. It was a little bit weird. And there was like a part with like a lake. Um, there was a part with a lake that got cut that looked very beautiful, but... Um, but yeah, there was like a part where you could go into the screen into like this lake area with like a little with like a ghost elemental that you could fight. And that ghost elemental thing ended up in the afterlife area. He's one of the mini bosses. Um, so it wasn't completely scrapped. Let me save. I love the Firelink Shrine in Dark Souls 1 so much. Um, it is quite possibly, Dark Souls 1 quite possibly has my favorite structure, world structure of any game ever. Um, and uh, I remember being upset <laughs> that Dark Souls 2 and Bloodborne didn't quite capture the exact same world structure as Dark Souls 1. Even if I still love those games, uh, that was, Farling Shrine was definitely an inspiration for this area. Bastas... Bast is obviously the uh, the one character that is here because he's gonna kill other NPCs, just like uh, just like there is an NPC that kills characters in Dark Souls One and in Demon Souls. I cannot remember their names for the life of me. I apologize. I promise. I am a Dark Souls fan. I just don't remember their names. Um, but I remember in Demon Souls, you find him in the Tower of Latria. Sigur is very much uh, a character created by Alex. Um, and so is Bast. Um, I'm gonna go right first, I guess. I I liked how open the original That's Gambit is, but um, the reason we changed it <laughs> was because a lot of people would be going to a Mulder's Observatory way too early and dying over and over and then quitting the game. Don't get me wrong, I wish I had found a way to keep it available 
right off the get-go. Um, but I'm also just happy with the new structure, too. Um, it's different. I wouldn't say it's better or worse. It's just different. Um, some people prefer one or the other. Three abilities. Sweet. Uh, these little guys. Um, so my original idea with them was that I wanted them to kind of touch on a theme about the game, and that is immortality. And while we have immortal characters, we also have these little lizards that uh, die really quickly and have very small lifespans. And so, I don't know. Uh, it'll sort of make you think. Like, wow. They only live a few days. I... <laughs> I love this song, too. Barbarian boots. Those are good. Forgot those were there. Okay. Um. Damn it. I lost a crystal lizard. I'm not going to get that. I believe this is a spell blade? Yeah. I guess I will try to fight the... the the Drake Knight. Ooh, did not get the perfect block there. I should have placed traps. Oh no! Ooh, that was so close. I am not getting these correctly. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. The Drake Knights were effectively designed to be like uh, like the hardest optional knights that just sometimes appear in like optional areas. Just like um, certain Dark Knights in Dark Souls 1. I forget their names now. I remember in, uh, in, in Undead Parish, there's like one in like a tower before the boar mini boss. That was kind of the inspiration a little. Although these are clearly way faster than those. So the original idea was that they'd be insanely hard. And I think they're kind of nerfed from the original game. They're still really hard, but yeah. Central Sanctuary is also another uh, sort of following the same vibe of Guy's Cradle, which is like very... Sort of Mononoke inspired, I guess. I'm sure there were more inspirations, I just at this point forget. This area was added because uh, a lot of players, rightfully so, mentioned that the weight of the bulwark felt a little empty and there needed to be sort of like more areas between the bosses, um, between Bulwark and the Phoenix Rider. Ah! I probably could beat the Bulwark. I almost definitely can. But just for the sake of this playthrough, I will not. Maybe I will cut this part where I return. Whatever, Bulwark. Um, I believe the inspiration for the Bulwark was just... He's the gatekeeper of Alduin, and you cannot progress the game until you beat him. Um, he is much easier now, but the original intention was that you would fight him right away, realize that he's too hard for you, go somewhere else, and then um, and then finally be able to beat him later and feel good about it. 
Um, but uh, we changed our minds, and now he's just a boss you can fight. One of the one of the first few bosses besides the Phoenix Rider. Um, that is why he is called the Bulwark. He's supposed to be a wall that you cannot be. He originally wouldn't uh, make his wings appear until you're like in a second phase, I believe. I think that was in the original Death Gambit too. That dash attack was added in Afterlife, I believe. We felt like he needed another attack. Immediately introducing some type of DPS race mechanic. Not many people enjoy those, but I do for some sick and twisted reason. I think one thing you'll realize from this playthrough is that a lot of things were designed this game were designed in this game a certain way, not because they were good, but because I wanted them to be that way. <laughs> I I wanted the game to be something. I, the design of the game was effectively designed for me and not for anyone else, really. <laughs> Most games are designed with accessibility in mind, uh, with appealing to as wide of an audience in mind. I just wanted to appeal to myself, which is crazy. Um, but I also knew that while designing this game, I knew that I may never get the opportunity to effectively design something for myself. So I made a lot of decisions that I wouldn't have otherwise. And I don't know if I'll ever get to make a game that is 100% whatever I want again. Because sometimes it leads to you making design decisions that would probably make the game sell more, you know? But, uh, not gonna lie, sometimes I cared more about making the game I wanted than making a game that sold. Amazingly. Like, the difficulty of this game, uh, a lot of people said, or I've read a lot of posts that say that the difficulty of the game is too hard, that Dark Souls is not about the difficulty. And let me be clear, <laughs> I, I know Dark Souls is not about the difficulty. Um, I knew that from the beginning. I just wanted to make a hard game. Um, I don't think I will be making another hard game next, uh, or for a while. Uh, but for this one, I wanted to make it hard. Again, I designed it for myself. It's kind of silly. I don't think it makes me a better game designer, so I'll just apply. I'll just let you guys know that I wouldn't do that. Uh, in games that I'm working on right now. But if there were ever a sequel to Death's Gambit, I would definitely keep the difficulty the same because it is the identity of this game at this point. I always get frustrated when game sequels don't match the difficulty or the uh, or the identity of the original. Um, sometimes it's okay, um, but sometimes it's uh, it feels like it's denying the fans the sequel that they wanted so if there were another death scam but i would keep the difficulty that said um this game is hard um i guess at this rate i will go to the sniper boss then go back to the phoenix rider um and do maybe the sewers and and the phoenix rider and then uh other stuff on the west side of the map. Um, afterwards. Uh, picking towns haphazardly at this point.
Love these little frog guys. Not gonna lie, those frog guys are, are there to add comedic relief. <laughs> they're, they're, the, they're there to have some funny stuff in the game because I feel like the game is kind of dark. Um, and you can't have the game be super dark and not have something funny and silly in it, in my honest opinion. Or at least in my opinion, it, it makes it a better game. So that's why they are there. I know some people feel like they they do not belong in the game, but I disagree. That Haystara is incredible from beginning to end. So I will be wearing that. And I'm going just to get a carrot. What did this guy drop again? I'll try and fight him anyways. I, I think he is really hard from what I remember. So let's uh, put some traps. Ah, I guess he's not that hard, huh? This blood fountain um, was designed by Alex. He felt like this area needed something cool that stands out, which I agree. It looks awesome. I can't remember if we did this, but I believe we wanted the Blood Knight to have some interaction with this fountain. If he, if he doesn't, um, or if it doesn't, then I wish we had because it's so cool. I think originally we were just going to make it heal you to max if you're a Blood Knight or something. I don't know. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite moments in this entire game is coming up right now where Fink blows up your save point. I, I don't think I've seen many other games that do that. And I love it. Let's see if we can get him. No! No, I couldn't. And he just ran off, I guess. I was about to crash down, but I forgot I don't have the crash down ability. I'm going to go down in a second to save. This area, the way it was designed, actually, now I remember, was that I wanted people to struggle to find a save point and be like, oh, where's the save point? Um... Because in Dark Souls, there are those areas where part of the challenge is just, okay, which way do I go? Like, the, the, deciding where to go is part of the strategy of solving an area. And this area definitely, I feel like on your first playthrough, it gives you that sense of tension where you're like, Ugh, which, but do I want to go down? Like, that probably isn't the main way to progress. Literally, you know, that has the save point. And if you got the, the skeleton key, then you get to find a save point next to the boss. And so I, I, I wanted to have that like thing that added a little bit of... Uh, it's, it's different on each playthrough. So if you have a skeleton key, then you can uh, get a save point here. If you don't, then you'll struggle a little bit. Uh, I definitely wanted each playthrough to be a little bit... Have, have that like little... Those little wrinkles of... Of things that are different. Most people don't go up here to find the base church basement key. <laughs> that is on purpose. That's why it's so hidden. I believe originally you could actually walk into this, uh, into that room, and the room is completely arted up. It was like a very dark room with like explosives and slimes. But we did end up removing a lot of the rooms that were kind of hidden uh, in like weird doors that you go into it kind of it kind of felt a little uh it's not that it was a bad idea it's definitely a cool idea it was just a little bit inconsistent with how you exit and enter rooms and how do you put that in the map um i guess you would have to put like an extra you would have to like put like a little box here like a box here that would indicate where you are but yeah it wasn't that good of a room honestly <laughs> it's a little bit not too fun 
But Alduin, man, Alduin also had a lot of iteration. This game had so many different versions, and I, I like this this last version of Afterlife is is definitely the best one. <laughs> Anything that got cut was cut for a reason. This sniper boss, we are so proud of. I mean. For the record, th we had no idea what the character's name was or anything when we were first making this boss. We just knew that we wanted a sniper boss. Um, sort of, I guess, inspired by Metal Gear Solid's The End. Um, which is one of my favorite series of all time. Um, I believe Origa was originally called Vance or something. Um, it had no real story. Um... But the original inspiration for this character was actually uh, the second episode, I believe, of Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex. I believe there's like a... Uh, how do I even explain this? There is like a character that becomes like a robot and their family doesn't approve of it. And I believe that was like the main inspiration for the story of Oregon or something. It's very different how we did it. Um, so I wouldn't say it's the same but uh but the original idea was that Origa's parents were religious and they didn't approve of her decisions and she ended up surviving everyone from guard of the tomb uh and just lives here sort of forever and i wouldn't say in regret but at least uh pondering her life decisions or or everything that happened to her Definitely a tragic character. The bulwark chosen of Baldwin. People clamored in admiration. We definitely wanted her to, to at the end of the day, be a good uh, ca character that does like you. As you um, yeah, if you die to this boss, you end up getting jailed here. Um, with every boss, we wanted something cool and unique that stands out. Um, I like to think I am boss design is one of my biggest fortes it's one of the things i think about constantly i don't think i don't think people think about boss design more than me like ever like i i think about it constantly um i should make a video of my favorite boss fights ever and talk about how what the pillars of design should be for making one um and i can't lie this boss this game was made because i wanted to make boss fights like <laughs> Or, like I, this the original draft for Death's Gambit was just a list of boss fights. There was not that much of a story. It was just these are a bunch of cool ideas I want to make, um, and that slowly became that version that was kind of like a sci-fi Metroidvania. And then slowly it was a, and, and it was a sci-fi Metroidvania with guns because I didn't think I could make melee combat satisfying. I uh, it was at a time where I was a very rookie programmer. I was still in high school, um, and and freshman year of college. The first, the first code that was ever put into this game was Christmas 2010 or 2011 when I was just home freshman year of college. Um, I will probably make some videos about boss design because I think a lot needs to be said. <laughs> I have a lot of th thoughts in my head about boss design. So I am very proud of them in this game and very proud that we managed to make them so unique and each one of them stands out on, on its own because... There are many Souls-like bosses and many bosses in games that don't stand out. Um, but I love Dark Souls 1s. Uh, honestly, I love all the Souls-like. Though there was a moment uh, where I was a little bit worried they wouldn't make amazing boss fights anymore. I When Dark Souls 1 came out, I was wondering if it was a fluke how good that game was. But they have since proven me wrong. They made so many more incredible games. So many more incredible combat systems and bosses etc they're absolutely they're an absolutely amazing company so um there was a unique mechanic that got cut from this boss because it was incredibly hard to implement um and would have been something i don't think i've ever seen in a game before and that is that each one of these gravestones were supposed to be notes left by players online um the idea would be that uh, they would appear wherever players plays notes and you would get like maybe like 15 of them randomly selected um, and the idea would be that players online would have to help you avoid the sniper shots and maybe like if you ran out 
like new ones would pop up if someone was there playing this boss around the same time or something. Um, I'm sad we were never able to implement it, but I do like that this boss still stands out as something very unique. I I love when Dark Souls bosses or Souls-like bosses have very sad music in the background. They stand out so much. It's just so cool and emotional. Um, so, so happy about this boss, uh, the, of how this ended up. We definitely struggled for a bit to figure out how to make people find the boss because some like originally the boss would just sometimes stay stealth mode for a long time and wait for you to find them and it was kind of boring and it would last forever um which was more similar to the end in, in metal gear where sometimes you'd have a lot of lull and wait time um while trying to find the boss and it is a cool idea um maybe eventually i'll make another sniper boss and do it do it like that and make it a way longer boss but at the end of the day, it has been done before in Metal Gear Solid 3. So, it wouldn't be that unique of an idea, would it? So, I don't know if I need to do it. It's already been done amazingly well in that game. Some people did find this boring sometimes, just waiting around, but... I don't know. It matches the pacing of the music. It's okay. It is what the boss is supposed to be. So many people die here at the end. She she secretly gets way more aggressive near the end. Even though it looks like she doesn't have a second phase, she secretly has like things that make her more aggressive over time. Originally, you could sort of double jump over this bridge by mist like if you were really really good. A child is not to blame for the environment in which they are raised. Can you rouse this guy? He's not far off. Give it 10, 20 years, he'll be King a vowels. pile of shivering bones by then. It makes me bring up the idea that... So the Ashes of Vados expansion, where you go to Vados, um, that was my original idea for a sequel to that Gambit. I originally felt that if I were to make a sequel, that the first thing we should do is go to Vados uh, and deal with the king who started the expeditions. Um, but since I didn't know if I would get the opportunity to make a sequel at the time, I added it as a part of Ashes of Vados. No. Too many will suffer for his ambitions. Sorrow resonates through the kingdoms. I can feel it in the air, but I will assuage their pain. No longer will a mother suffer the loss of a child. When all are immortal, since we're talking about Bados and what I had originally planned for the sequel, uh, this may come as a surprise, but I originally did want. If I were to make that version of, of, of the game where you were to attack Vados in a sequel or something like that, the main character would have been uh would have been Ash. Uh well, well, maybe there's redemption for you yet. I I think the idea was that you would and this make this makes no sense with the current story of the game, but the idea would have been that you play as Ash um hunting down uh death gods and shinigamis and uh because he has such a fervent hatred for vados for destroying his life uh the game would be about you know setting the world on fire while you wish to go to cash so we had to put this here because we wanted the player to go right and find the door uh that gates you from progressing the one that shows all the boss sigils i think that's fairly obvious actually um some people mentioned that there is undertale inspiration in this game um and for the most part it is wrong but uh i feel like this area has a little bit of undertale inspiration um partly because it's one of the last areas we made and and designed uh 
and that was post me playing Undertale. Um, but prior to Contrary Belief, Thalamus was not inspired by Flowey at all. Um, I know the fight is basically a jump scare, just like Flowey is, but um, most of the design for the game was complete before I had played Undertale. It was, I mean, Thalamus was conceived as an idea and the art for it was conceived, you know, in 2014, to my knowledge. Um, and the idea to make this uh, inspired by H.P. Lovecraft was pre-Bloodborne. Um, I know that sounds insane, but it was. I remember loving Tower of Latria and Dark Souls 1, no, and Demon Souls, sorry, and feeling like that would, that is like the, the best part of that game and that uh, atmosphere is amazing and that those games should go in that direction. They should go in the H.P. Lovecraft direction because it matches the the themes and the, the absolute despair of the gameplay. So originally the game was going to be way more H.P. Lovecraft. And then halfway through development, uh, Bloodborne came out and I kind of got depressed. I'm not going to lie. I was depressed for a while because we want it to be the first H.P. Lovecraft. So it was like, um, then we were like, oh, let's make, uh, maybe let's add some Asian inspiration, like, uh, stuff like Princess of Minoke or like anime inspiration. And then Sekiro and Neo happened and we we're like, well, fuck it. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll just do our own thing, but it will still have a little bit of HP Lovecraft inspiration with Thalamus. Um, because that is something I really wanted in the game. Um, and the boss was, in my opinion, I wanted to try and uh, make something as cool, if not better, than uh, this Metal Gear Solid boss. What's this called? Uh, Psycho Mantis. I, I felt like if Psycho Mantis was an HP Lovecraft boss, that would be Thalamus. And that was, that was the idea, so that we wanted to make something super creepy that, like, shocks you and, like, just blows your mind with, like, a crazy mechanic. Um, that was, that was the original idea. Um, I will progress into Froopy's restaurant. Yeah. As I was saying, this area is a little bit, uh, inspired by the silliness of Undertale, but I would say nothing else really in the game is. Uh, as I mentioned before, I wanted there to be a little bit of silliness to the game. Um, because, uh... I don't know. Games are... Games are silly. Pasta la vista, bucko. I'm pretty sure I wrote that one. Pasta la vista, bucko. I would not have written that today. <laughs> um, sometimes I feel like... Using memes that are too common are not the right choice. Maybe using a meme from 10 years or more is... This 10 years older or more would be better, but whatever, it's funny. I, I think a lot of people love this scene, talking with death, so I'm glad. I, I'm really glad people love this scene. <laughs> I love it too. There, there is this thing in the lore of the game that death cannot interact with the real world, which is why you have to do these things. Um, but this is, uh, this is a little bit pushing it because he is cooking. He's doing something, but I guess it's not that big of a deal. We'll just let it slide. Yes, chef. Go. So I guess I will leave this ambiguous and not tell you what we had in mind with this character. I can't give out all the secrets today, unfortunately. Um, some of these were designed by one of my close friends, uh, or two of my close friends, Thomas and Taylor, friends from USC. Uh, the art, the art of them and their animation. This character was, uh, I believe, animated by Alex, actually. This one, specifically. And the writing 
was mostly written by Kyle, our composer, because I asked him, hey, can you... <laughs> we have this character who's effectively trying to sell you his mixtape. <laughs> what would they say if they were a real person? I believe this... The fact that you get trapped here, I was inspired by the the mod game, uh, Super Mario World game, um, Mario's Mystery Meat, I believe. There was something about that. There were some some silly things in this game that were actually inspired by that. I, I love that. Uh, that. That game. If you've never heard of Mario's Mystery Meat, I highly recommend that you look up Vinny Vine Sauce's, uh, Vine Sauce's um, two-hour playthrough of that game. It is so funny. It is one of my favorite things. One of my favorite games of all time. It is so dumb. Um, and some of it where the some of the some of the darker parts of that also inspired the secret areas in this game that uh, that uh, the ones that are a part of the Zyra Lotep quest line that uh, I would say Mario Mystery Meat and um, uh, what is this RPG Maker game? Yuma Nikki was also a big inspiration for that. Those are the two biggest inspirations for those secret areas. I would like to post more videos as well. Hopefully later I will also do an Undertale playthrough and eventually a Deltarune playthrough on this channel. Um, for those, I really can't talk about the development, obviously. I didn't work on Undertale, but I did work on Deltarune, so I can. Uh, I feel more comfortable ta uh, playing Undertale because I didn't work on that game. But I I would like to do a playthrough and give my thoughts, my complete thoughts on it. Um, and I would also like to make some other videos potentially as i explained before maybe on, on boss design and some other game design topics uh potentially going over um thoughts on certain games as well Mo mostly nintendo games probably i i play everything i really do i i have such a problem where i enjoy basically every video game um many people have like their own specific like pace of, of games they like but personally I, I like basically everything except sports games so yeah anyways where i was going with that was that although i like every every type of game i am mostly a nintendo uh fan he's pretty good he's died less than you lumber king are naturalists i came up with the idea of this character i just wanted one to make fun of you for using save points i thought that was sort of silly and unique. Um, I don't know if this guy comes up as well on New Game Plus, but I believe in Vados, he can appear under certain conditions. I don't remember what those were. Um, I believe if you have killed the crow, he appears um, as a substitute. I, I don't remember we have that feature in the final game, but I believe he does. I believe it is in the final game. Um, but it is rare. It's not you don't see that often. I don't think many people talk about it. This little slime that you kill here <laughs> was uh, was actually a slime that was a part of a college project that I made. Um, there was a little mini game that I had made that lasted like an that was like an hour long game called Out of Out of Your Element or something like that, where there was like a slime that you could run over, and uh, everyone who played the game was really upset when they killed the slime, like really upset and sad. So I just added it back to this game because I'm evil. And there's almost no way to, to walk through that hallway without killing it. Ah. I found this missive on a corpse here. F Fink? <laughs> Fink trapped their ghost foot. Mustn't let them get away. No, no. So silly. Um, by the way, the voice of Fink is uh, Kraken, Twitch streamer Kraken, who is a uh, who studied at USC with us. Um, overall, amazing person. Please follow him on Twitch and watch him play video games. His voice is so perfect for Fink. Oh, 
Of course it did. All right. Be back. <laughs> and he will be back. Pink always comes back. That's another idea I don't think I've seen. Actually, that's not true. I I don't think I've seen a Dark Souls character that keeps coming back after they die, besides maybe patches between games, but I just wanted to do that. I don't think I've seen a character that is just a huge asshole that just keeps dying and, and trying to kill you, and etc. Okay, I'm going to get this guy this time. Nope! Oh man, he juked me. Onwards. I'm really glad, and I was thinking about that in the Fink cutscene, I'm really glad people like Vral as a character. It's kind of hilarious how many tweets I've seen of people, be people being horny over Vral on Twitter. Um, that was not the intention at all <laughs> with the character that we had when we originally first made them. But, uh, damn. People be thirsty on Twitter. What can I say? Uh, this is one of the first NPCs we ever made for the game. Uh, that's why if you attack him, he shoots you with a Gatling gun. And the Gatling gun is really scuffed how it's programmed. Because it's one of the first things we ever programmed for the game. And, uh... I'll just leave it at that. Actually, let me buy some stuff from him. Oh, you you might just those guys best we Sorry if I'm skipping some of the dialogue. I I have a lot of stuff to do, so Not. maybe it's good that I'm skipping some things. That seat of knowledge looks pretty good right now. Um, I don't need those tomes for beating those bosses. I'm too good at this game to need those tomes. These ice hearts. I weirdly enjoy fighting these. Shield of warding. Yeah, I guess that's why you shouldn't get this as an uh, as an item at the beginning because it's you can get it so quickly. Fair enough. Maybe we should have put that later into the game. All right, fighting this jerk. We on purpose put that I on purpose put that bow animation on this or like bow attack on this character because we wanted we wanted players to see how cool your abilities could get right off the gate. And I I can't deny the axe is one of my favorite weapons in the game. I might switch if I get the abilities for the axe. I should. I should get the abilities for the axe. Right. So now we get to talk about what happened. With the voice acting for this character. Ah, it's not often we so, as many of you know, this is the voice of uh, Critical, uh, Penguin Z Zero on YouTube, I believe. Um, we absolutely love uh, <laughs> watching Critical's videos. I honestly haven't watched them in a while, but um, at the time, Alex and I watched a lot of his videos. And, um, I loved all his Dark Souls videos, etc. And, uh, yeah, we wanted... we. I, I don't remember if we emailed him first or if he emailed us about making a voice in our game. Uh, I wish I remembered. I think he emailed us first if we wanted a voice. Um, and we said yes. Um, and originally, uh, the voice w just didn't match the the other voices of the game. It I won't lie. Like, um, I really wanted to put it in the game. And it's kind of it kind of was my fault that the OG Death's Gambit did not have his voice. Um, and... Uh, later on, Alex and Kyle suggested that uh, we add some some effects to his voice, and that actually made it match better. Um, and I kind of regret not doing that <laughs> uh, for the original game, and so that's why Critical's voice is in the game. Because um, we fixed it. Um, it was kind of my fault in the first place for not coming up with a good solution. Um, but I'm really happy with how it turned out now. And, uh as some of you may not know, or some of you may not know, but Critical made a video about how sad he was that his voice didn't make it into the original Death's Gambit. Um, and as soon as it came out, Alex and I were like, oh god, I can't believe this happened. <laughs> um, like, I felt so bad, and I, I legitimately felt horrible when it originally, when we, I originally made the decision to not put it in. Um, and 
it really was just me having a lack of creativity because it clearly sounds fine now. So yeah, I, I clearly wanted the setup to be like Dark Souls 1 um, where you get a teleport later on. Um, I'm not a big fan of fast travel and teleport in games. Um, I, I am in certain open world games like Breath of the Wild. Like I don't care too much for it. Um, but in, in Metroidvania's, I, I definitely like the idea that it's something that should be earned. Um, that makes the game, makes you sort of remember the structure of the game a little bit before you start teleporting everywhere. I think it's a nice, happy medium approach. I know it would have been nice to have teleport right away, but, uh, again, I designed this game for myself, not for anyone else. And so that was my decision. Um, where was I going? Heroic rematches. Um, that was a mechanic that I really, like, I was... That was one of the mechanics I really wanted in this game. Um, one of the original like documents of this game had the idea of heroic rematches. Because, um, as we've talked before, I like hard games. I am that type of player that always fights the optional super hard bosses in every game. Um, like Every Final Fantasy game has like secret optional bosses at the end. And like Undertale and Deltarune has like, secret optional bosses that are really hard. I, I am that player that loves fighting those hard bosses. And I wanted the game to be about as hard as you want it to be. If you really want some hard stuff, there is optional bosses that you can fight that are hard right at the beginning of the game. Um, and I love that. I wish more games did that because that's something I enjoy in games is when I get tested. Um, if I really want it. Um, uh, and there are many games that do it in many different ways, like say Tears of the Kingdom or Breath of the Wild. You can just go fight a boss right away early when you're not uh, not high high level or whatever, or have good gear. I love that. Anyways, Phoenix Rider. I have a, quite a lot to say about this boss. Uh, the original design for this boss was so different. It's bonkers. Let's defeat the boss first and I will give a little chat about the original encounter. I will say that the heroic version of this boss is very brutal and I definitely wanted it to feel like the gargoyles in Dark Souls 1 where like you're fighting two clones and it all comes down to the wire. Like, they have just enough health where, like, you always die, like, at the, at the very last sliver of HP. That's why that boss is so infuriating, not gonna lie, but that was the original design. Uh, I wanted it to be um, a boss that made you want to keep going back to it, but was still hard. Um, and so well, one way you can do that is by making it, like, all come down to the wire. And feel like you can kill it the next try, you know? Like, I got them. I got them now. Also, you get this debuff when you get hit where your healing amount is reduced. I think a lot of people don't notice that, but... Um, that is one of the things that I wanted to do differently when compared to Dark Souls, is debuffs and buffs. Bosses sometimes give some crazy-ass debuffs. <laughs> crazy debuffs that uh, you wouldn't normally see in Dark Souls uh, that are creative and different. This music, wrote, like, it rules. Oh my god. Actually, wait. What I was going to say about the Phoenix Rider. The original encounter for that boss was that you would fight the phoenix on top or like you would fight the phoenix right on top of the phoenix you were flying around and i believe there are gifts of this online somewhere i might post them on this video if, if i have time but um you would have to hold on to the phoenix from time to time because it would sometimes got nosedive downward so you're fighting you're fighting on top of the phoenix and it would sometimes nosedive down or or fly upwards and if you weren't holding on to the phoenix you would just fall off and die um and I think there was a world where we could have made it work. Um, I was not as good of a game designer back then, so I just felt like it, it just wasn't working. Um, 
And also, the Phoenix was not big enough to to hold the Phoenix Rider because um, all her moves are so big or covered so much of the space. It just felt claustrophobic. But um, yeah, the original idea would be that there are four climbable bosses. One of them was a Forgotten Guy, and one of them was Kusiv, and one of them was a Phoenix Rider. And then one of them was a Dark Knight. I believe the original idea would be that the Dark Knight would turn into other, like a shadow beast, like a shadow boar that you would like hold on to or something. And those were like the four Knights of Endless. Um, and uh, those bosses are still in the game. They're just not climbable because um, that was really hard to do and insanely hard to do for a game designer and developer that was still in college and I was still figuring everything out and I didn't know how to program at the beginning, etc. It was too ambitious, but I wish we had the budget, time, etc. to have done that version. That said, uh, some of it was not that fun. So it kind of is some, I'm somewhat glad that we didn't do it because we tried a lot, but it wasn't as fun as the current iteration of the bosses. So maybe what makes more sense, more, what would have made more sense would, would have been to make a completely separate game that was more about the climbing, like a 2D, truly 2D Shadow of the Colossus. And it was focused more on that. Um, that was separate to Death's Gambit. I think that would have probably made more sense. All right, we continue. I uh, I looked back at the footage, and it seems it's already about two hours. So I think uh, I will not be close. I will not be one hundred percenting the game because I don't want these videos to be too long. So I will be trying to get to the end. Maybe I'll do ending A if I feel a little bit uh, ambitious. <laughs> uh, I would like to because there's some cool stuff to talk about there, but we'll not make promises. Honestly, I probably shouldn't. This is already a very long video. Um, my guess is I'll split it into two. It, this is not an easy boss to make. I think I've posted this on Twitter, but I truly believe there is a linear correlation graph. <laughs> there's a linear correlation. Uh, with the size of a boss uh, to how long it takes to develop a boss. The bigger the boss, the longer and harder it is to make it. And sometimes it's never, not even worth it because players don't tend to find the biggest bosses the most fun. Uh, in my honest opinion, it, it, they're still great. Don't get me wrong, I love giant bosses. I personally enjoy them equally as much, but I think more people like smaller bosses that feel more like a true test of of your of your combat abilities so if, so like the boss that is your same size with your same mechanics is what people tend to like more that said i wanted to have variety it's always great to have variety in the boss fights and i personally really love how this boss turned out the bosses i mean the yeah i don't know where i was going with that Oh god, he's much faster now. Ah. I got lucky, he didn't stop me there. A lot of people struggle with this boss. I believe there's just supposed to be a, a guy and a son of, of Gaia who, um, who we don't really who's a god who we really don't talk about a lot in the story um i feel like that would be something that we should explore more if there were more content for that scam it for sure and the guys were supposed to play a bigger role in the story i don't know if everyone remembers but there is a, a original trailer there was a trailer that we originally put out for the game before we even had a publisher where there was like a Shane Gaian. Um, and that was supposed to take, that was supposed to be a boss. <laughs> Once again, this is just, this boss was in a document. This is barely, this was barely made, but there was a boss that originally I called, uh, I believe, Gar the Destroyer or Bar the Destroyer. And that was supposed to be the Shane Gaian. Uh, which was supposed to be in the Immortal Citadel, was one of the bosses, one of the many bosses that was supposed to be in the Immortal Citadel. 
when the game was originally only four areas big or whatever, um, and sci-fi, um, the idea would be that you'd fight him while he's changed and he can't reach su super far to the left side of the screen and you just dodge his arms, uh, smashing the platform to the, to the left. It's, this is kind of hard to explain unless you've seen the video that I'm talking about. I might post a GIF here if I remember to do that. <laughs> uh, where am I going? So there's something cool to say about this area, and that is that originally Wraith King Sarad, the boss of this area, uh, was meant to be just a regular enemy in Ilna. Uh, it was supposed to be an invincible enemy that chases you around and attacks you, and so you have to run away from them throughout the level in Ilna. Uh, and I posted that recently in, uh, on Twitter. Uh, because I mentioned that it was sort of inspired by the Water Wraith in Pikmin, which was also an invinci invincible enemy that would chase you around. Um, but it, well, that wasn't the only inspiration. I mean, I, you've all, you can also see that mechanic in Spelunky. There's like a ghost enemy in Spelunky that chases you if you take too long in a floor and they're invincible. And the idea here was would have been the same, that if you take too long in the level, Wraith King Sarad would appear in an invincible form to kill you. Um, and we did try it I, once again here in the Sky Tomb. But the level wasn't big enough for you to kind of run away from it. I think if I were to actually... If, for it to work, this area would have needed to be bigger and more maze-like. Um, instead, you just have him appear here and scare you. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, um, so Wraith King Sarad would have appeared here and attacked you, uh, and you'd have to run away from it. It also wasn't very fun. We did try it, um, but it was just not implemented well. I think we could have done it, um, if we had redone this area to make it work, but we didn't. <laughs> I didn't feel it was worth it. Bet we tried. This entire area, Sky Tomb, was originally all one giant room. It didn't have these, like, exits. But it ran horribly on Switch. It was atrocious, and there was really no way to fix it. It was originally one giant room, and so the only way we thought we could fix it is just by cutting it into pieces like this. Which is better also for being able to tell where you are on the map, I guess. One of my favorite bosses is this one. Um, it's like... It's like so simple. It's learn the patterns, dodge at the right time. Uh, it's, it's pure Dark Souls. And that's what I wanted with this boss. No, no gimmicks, or no big gimmicks at least. It's just you and the boss. Besides the fact that he teleports around. spamming that one attack, huh? Oh, that was lucky. He got annihilated. That axe throw. Axe really doesn't feel that good unless you have that talent point. That makes the animation faster, huh? Worked out, though. Because uh, he has a, such a huge hitbox. Cool. Okay. We're flying. If it, if it sounds because uh, that I'm a little bit more tired, it's because it is later in the day right now. And I have been recording this entire playthrough in one session. Darkness Falls. Uh, there's a few things to say about this area. Uh, specifically, the name Darkness Falls was <laughs> not inspired by the movie Darkness Falls. It actually, uh, I actually don't think it was inspired by this, but 
maybe it was in the back of my mind because there is an area, a really cool area in an old MMO called Dark Ages of Camelot. I remember there was one of the one of the hardest dungeons in that game was called Darkness Falls. It was a it was a raid dungeon where you could PvP in and it had like the hardest bosses in that game. Um, and I just remember it being a really cool name. Uh, uh, we knew from the start that this area would be like a little, uh, kind of ha would have a little bit of a puzzle to it. Um, like we knew from the start that we wanted this to be like new Londo a little bit, new Londo for from like Dark Souls One, which which is like an area that like you can access right away, but um, but if you don't know what to do, then you can't really progress. So that was the idea here. And the idea is that uh, you have to figure out how to turn the enemies uh, to not be invincible. And then also figure out that the boss can be revived by the enemies in this area. And if you figure all that out, then the boss is much easier. Let me open this checkpoint, actually. So that was that was the goal. It ended up being... Oh, okay. I can open it from the other side. Um... That was the, that was the goal. Um, it turned out that basically no one figured it out and just fought the Dark Knight um, without killing the the enemies in this area. We put those sunstones on the ground to kind of give people a hint, though. Some people did figure it out, but I don't know. It felt like most people didn't. And the original game had the Dark Knight being a little bit harder. We made it a little bit easier because we had many friends who told us they killed the Dark Knight on their 40th attempt or something insane. Like they were fighting it for like hours and hours and they never figured out what to do. God, I love this music. This is like the best. Um... Once again, reminds me of stuff like Circuit Brush Symphony from uh, Donkey Kong Country 2 or Aquatic Ambience from Donkey Kong Country 1. Okay, this checkpoint I will open. In case you haven't realized, I also love the soundtrack to Donkey Kong Country. Um, David Wise, the composer, is a genius. One of the first uh, bosses we made was this one. Um, Brian did an amazing job with the animations. It's crazy. As soon as we started making Afterlife, we knew that we needed to make a, his hand a weapon. Like that is like the coolest weapon in the in the whole game. This boss did not actually go through that much iteration besides making it easier for Afterlife and... Uh, actually, there was one thing. <laughs> uh, oh no. Man, he hits like a truck. Um, yeah, he used to be twice as big. <laughs> his, his animation... Uh, we had to scale him down because it just was super annoying to fight him while he was two, ti two times the scale. That's why the animations for this boss took such a long time because it was animated at a bigger scale. Sweet. I will switch that weapon because I love that weapon. And I'm going to switch the abilities as well. Don't mind. I'll leave you alone because this is effectively effectively a speedrun at this point. <laughs> Not really. But yeah. I will Hmm, what next? Let us let's just just continue with the main uh Main talent points. I will decide on what abilities to use soon. 
threat level Omega detected. We're Origin. we love we love how this uh, this character turned out. Remain calm and, and the the voice actress did an amazing job, um, sounding like a glitchy character. There are some we did edit this to sound even more glitchy, but she did a lot of that. Uh, a lot of those glitchy sounds on her own. <laughs> it was awesome. Like, this is barely touched up after recording it, <laughs> which is crazy. Which, by the way, recording the voices for this game was probably some of the most fun I've had in game development. Besides, um... Besides watching players try to figure out how to unlock Zyra Halotep, that's probably the most fun I've ever had. Guarded Tomb. Uh, there is a lot to say about this area. For starters, what does Guarded Tomb even mean? Um, it, I believe my original intention for that name was that it was a garbled version of the words Guarded Tomb. So a tomb that was guarded by technology or something uh i know that sounds very that kind of <laughs> makes it sound way less cool but it's the truth that is what it's supposed to stand for um we knew from the very beginning that we wanted an area that was very dark cyberpunk uh Partly because Alex and I love that aesthetic. Even if, like... I don't know. Even if there are not many games that we like with that aesthetic, we knew we wanted to do it for a Souls-like style game. Because for some reason, I had a feeling no one else would do something like that. I'm also surprised that no one has done an area like Ilnoth in a Souls-like. Um, Bloodborne sort of comes close, but they did not make an Ilnoth style area. Oh god, I forgot. Um, Ilnoth is probably my favorite area. Like, by a long shot. It was the area that I was mostly looking forward to, besides this one. This area did change quite a bit. It uh, was originally a completely different layout. It was even more mazy, if you can imagine. This this is always there. This is The idea that you had to, like, go through walls in this area was always here. Um, I knew that I wanted it to be very Metroid-y, where you'd find, like, these little map stations that would show you, like, a map of the area, and then you'd have to find a way to get to that part of the map in that little area, like, the map that gets shown over there. Um, anyways, um, this is, this is Metroid Fusion inspired, like, from the, from the very core. Um, and so that never changed. That... That stayed. The idea that Bicerge appears at the beginning of the area, um, uh, that was actually always there. I we actually had written a lot, a very, a very like, I don't know, extensive amount of things for Bicerge. Bicerge is is such a cool character. Um, we we uh we originally had the boss fight for Bicerge take place on like a cybernetic train. And the train would like go up and down, like rotate, and like the whole camera would rotate. So you'd be fighting the boss, the boss like sideways and like upside down, and uh, people hated it. Um, another idea would have was that you would fight it on an ele elevator, which is why I am really happy that in Afterlife we did add that you have to fight by surge on an elevator um, in the midway point of this level. Um, double dots on this guy. Bleed and burn. In MMOs, the way you play the game as a DPS is that you have to play, uh, press all your abilities, ability buttons in a certain order in order to de deal the most damage um, and defeat a boss in a certain amount of time. Most of those bosses have an enraged timer, so everyone in the raid team has to... Um, has a DPS the boss as fast as possible and perform their DPS rotations. 
perfectly um, or as perfectly as possible. Um, I always felt that that's a really cool idea that single players have single player games have never done. And so um, I felt that one way to evolve upon the Dark Souls formula was to add a little bit of that uh, DPS rotation aspect uh, to the combat of the game. It's not necessary to do, you know, to, to apply two bleeds on an enemy and then uh, pop all your cooldowns and, and attack the enemy right after so, so you deal as much damage as possible. Um, it's not necessary. You can beat the game by just crashing down on a boss or just sliding into them, really, if you really want to. But it is easier if you find a rotation or, or find a strategy that deals the most damage. Um, in a quick, um, deals the most damage in a quick succession. <laughs> wow, I can't talk, and it is getting late. That's probably why. And what else is there to say about Guard of Tomb? Um, yeah, um, I think there is a misconception as to the the timeline of Cyrodiil. Um as to did Guarded Tomb come first, did Cyrodon come second, I feel like we kind of dropped the ball in explaining that super well. I think, I thought we did it correctly. I thought we had explained it well, but everyone seems to have misconceptions about this. So I will set the record straight right now um, and say that Guarded Tomb happened first before basically, and the Chamber of Migration for that matter. All that happened, you know, way, way, way before uh, the founding of Cyrodiil. Um And in fact, um, I believe it is explained, but um, the way Cyrodiil was founded was that someone explored uh, the area above Guarded Tomb, which was uninhabited, and that person went and found Guarded Tomb originally. And in the migration chamber, they found the source of immortality. And with the source of immortality, they left to the surface, uh, and with their newfound powers, they effectively established the kingdom of Cyrodiil. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense that someone with the power of immortality would be able to um, establish a kingdom because of their godlike powers. Um, and they uh, obviously uh, did not let anyone know about the civilization that they that they had found. Um, of course, I'm talking about Sarad. Um, since Sarad is the founder of Saradun, who else but him to have found the uh, the source of immortality here? Um, so yes, this area took place. This area wa was here way before everything that happened in Alduin. It's a, it's a silly little mini boss encounter, but I'm glad we put it in. I believe I made this in like five hours. <laughs> Near the end of Afterlife's development. This could easily have not made it into the final game, but one day I decided that I wanted it to go in. So... I'm really glad I did. Probably no one would have missed it if it wasn't here, but it is here. So this scene to the left here where Death is playing the game The Passage. Um, I, I believe I had one iteration where the game did actually begin with Death playing Passage, like no joke. But uh, for obvious reasons, I didn't do that. Um, I just felt it would be so insane that an indie game references another indie game uh, at the beginning of its <laughs> of its story. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That would have been crazy, but I'm sort of glad I didn't do that. It would have felt like me trying to be a little bit too indie and too silly. It would have seemed a little bit pretentious, probably. The voice for Vice Surge turned out so good. 
I believe, I believe it was uh, the same voice actor as Thomas and Bulwark. Uh, Jalen, I believe. This boss had so much more health when it originally was created. This is supposed to be the second big wall after Bulwark. And it sure was uh, <laughs> in the original game. It still kind of is. I, I hear a lot of people struggle with this boss. Oh boy, this is bad. Yeah, there's just a lot going on in this fight. There is so much for new players to figure out. This is, this is my typical over design. This is like how I typically design boss fights, which is like I over design them. I definitely have to learn the hard way that uh, only certain boss fights should have, boss fights should have a certain amount of complexity. And this one has a lot of it. I don't know. I actually don't regret it. I love this boss encounter. It's one of my favorites, for sure. But the... From the very beginning, I knew I wanted a boss. I, I knew I wanted the boss of Guarded Tomb to have this polarity, polarity mechanic. This attack was one of the first attacks I ever designed for the game. Uh, and Bysurge was the second boss we ever programmed and designed. It went through a decent amount of iteration. Uh, it didn't change a lot. It, I mean, it didn't, um, mechanically it didn't change a lot. It just became a little bit less complex. And, uh, we nerfed his HP a lot. The polarity mechanic, um, we sort of got the idea from a boss called Thaddeus in Naxxramas in World of Warcraft. Uh, and that boss, the way polarity works is that if two people of opposite polarity stand next to each other, they instantly die. Uh, here, uh, it obviously works in a very different way. But the idea of the polarity mechanic existing at all came from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this... This song sounds a little bit Mad Max. And I think, I think, I think the Mad Max Fury Road soundtrack was inspiring for this song. Uh, that and the Thalamus boss encounter in Ilnoth also were a little inspired by the Mad Max Fury Road soundtrack. <laughs> That is so loud. So we knew that this was like the quote unquote horror horror level. So we we immediately put like a like a few scary little moments here. Like you see the the big starfish face monster kind of lurking about and then he's in the shadows right there. We call this enemy the creeper internally. I don't even know why. I think every enemy just had to have a little internal name. Um, like the, uh, the jumpy little guys in this area were called internally the nightmared ghouls. Nightmared specifically uh, is actually a lore thing. Um, because uh, because Thalamus and his minions would effectively trap people in endless nightmares. Um, so these ghouls are just a nightmared uh, zombie thrall of Thalamus. And so are many of these humans trapped here in Journey's End. Uh, Journey's End being a prison for 
anyone that the the higher ups at Cyrodon didn't like. They would just send them down here to get nightmared and uh, live in eternity in torment. Um. Anyways, the inspiration for this area is clearly Tower of Latria <laughs> from Demon Souls. <laughs> Except it's upside down. We're not climbing up a tower. We're going down spires in a cave. And honestly, I still love that idea. I think if we were to make... If this area was in 3D, it would be so cool. So these these were internally called the Nightmarers. These would be the Thalamus' minions who would nightmare uh, anyone and get them trapped in the Nightmare of Thalamus. And here comes everyone's favorite boss fight, the Eldritch Council. I wanted, I asked Kyle to make the most stress inducing song of all time, and this is what he made. I wanted this boss to be just the most stressful experience ever. And I think I succeeded. That doesn't mean it makes it a fun boss that everyone loves, but I enjoy it. And that's what matters, right? No, it's not. I apologize. I'm sorry that this boss is so cruel. But, um... It is a boss that requires many skills that no other boss in this game really asks for and in that sense i do like it i do like that you have this choice to choose between what enemy you want to kill first there's this like there's these like orbs that you have to like keep up there's like a lot of spinning plates that you have to keep spinning or else you die and uh in that sense this boss is very unique and very difficult. Alex was the pretty much handled the design of the boss in this area. That was originally just going to be an enemy in a mortal citadel and their sprite or like their character was supposed to be two times scale they were supposed to be a giant because originally we wanted the immortal citadel to just have giant enemies only it was supposed to be like the most impossible and hard area ever it was just giant enemies and so the Eldritch Inquisitor was just one of those enemies, and uh, we knew we needed a boss here. We knew we needed a character to play it, and because Immortal, Sh the Immortal Citadel changed a lot, we no longer had use for this character model, and we felt it made complete sense to put it here. So that's how the Eldritch Inquisitor ended up here, instead of an Immortal Citadel. Um, but I'd also like to add that the original, uh, document for this boss m mentioned that it was originally four completely different bosses that would appear when you destroy a crystal. And they all had completely different animations. But, uh, because we don't have all the, we, because we didn't have, uh, a huge budget, um, it kind of made no sense to make four completely different bosses here. Yeah, I believe the original boss encounter had four enemies. One was supposed to be like a tank, one was supposed to be like a ranger with like a bow, and then another one was supposed to be like a, a caster or a wizard. And then, I don't know, maybe a healer. And so like, you would have to fight all the four council members um, in the same way, um, but they all had completely different animations. Uh, I am glad we didn't do that. 
That would have taken a million years. The Magister's Labyrinth. One of the best areas that we added in Afterlife, for sure. They're all the best areas. What am I saying? I don't think a lot of people know this, but if you have the Contagion and you talk to the Grey Mage, um, she will get the Contagion and then she will start the fight with lower HP. I am not joking. That is a that is a real thing that we added into the game. <laughs> Um, and to elaborate a little bit more on the mages or, or the wizards, um, the wizards are inspired sort of by Gandalf the Grey and the blue mages from the Lord of the Rings series. So if you were to follow that logic, uh, Mulvaro would be one of the blue mages, obviously, because he's blue. Um, so we're missing one of one other blue mage. Um, and since the the mage in this area is the gray, then we would be missing the equivalent the equivalent of one of the blue mages, Saruman, and Radagast. So uh take that as you will. If we were to ever make a sequel, that would probably be where we would go. As for what is there is to say about this area, um I knew I wanted another platforming section like the halls of cruelty but one that was easier than the halls of cruelty um so this area was it was effectively designed to be a platforming challenge and an exploration challenge i wanted it to be hard to figure out how to find the save point and how to find checkpoints um so yeah i i knew i, I knew the original game didn't have enough platforming in it so <laughs> this was this was part of our solution to that. Cool. That was a little bit scary. <laughs> Did not have to be that scary. Let's open the checkpoint and then we'll go straight towards the boss. Within the theater of our mind, the dreamer stokes our unconscious ego. Most of the lore of this character and the room in which she resides is uh, is not something I actually know. It's Alex who who wrote this and who designed this room. Um, so I actually don't Light remember what he had in mind, <laughs> unfortunately. Under their own shortcoming. For he is no more. People fear what they don't. And in death. She has somehow become a servant of Thalamus, so she must be defeated. Ah, uh, yes, a bullet hell boss. In case you haven't heard. A lot of people beat this boss boss before they hear the full track for this boss, but I highly recommend that you Google the full version of the song because the second half of this song is so cool and basically no one gets to hear it. Because the boss doesn't last long enough for it to play. It's still a great song. I do like that a lot of the mechanics in this boss are things that aren't really done before. Like, we knew that we wanted this boss to require you to fly around. That was the one thing we wanted for this boss. Same thing with Sky Tomb, because we needed, we wanted both areas uh, to require you to fly around, and so that informed how we designed the boss in the area. Oh god, this is going terribly. This second phase is brutal. Oh, oh no. 
wow, I have not died in this entire game. I cannot let it start now. We haven't even gotten to the good part of the song. I'm just gonna let it. I'm just gonna let it play then, because we're basically there. Or did we already hear it? I'm too tired. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. I already heard it. All right, see ya. Oh no. Cool. The boss is particularly easy, and the reason for that is we knew that if it was harder, it would be annoying. Um, it's sometimes you design a boss and you realize it, it's it can't be too hard. The ones that are hard in this game are the ones that we knew would be fun to retry a million times. I traveled all the way over to the Guyan's Cradle because the next thing I need to do is defeat Kusa. Um, one of the first things I knew that I wanted to do after you after we started developing Afterlife was that I wanted to add an area below Guyan's Cradle that you sort of had no idea about. And then you're like, oh my god, like even at the beginning of the game, there's something new. Uh, I just love that uh, type of stuff. And consequently, this is one of my favorite areas in the game. It reminds me a lot of Metroid. Just seeing the little creatures like rotating around a little platform. Having like little secret areas like this one. There's just a lot of... A lot of fun little things with this area. This It's not particularly hard, it's just... It's just cool. The music is great. There's evil rabbits that turn into monsters. What is not to love? I also just love this parallaxing background. It's so cool. It makes you feel like there's a world underneath that has yet to be explored. Um, we really got some mileage out of this tile set that we used in the sewers as well. And I think, yeah, I think it just looks great. I think one of the craziest things about Death's Gambit is that we don't really reuse that much. We don't reuse that much art, really. Like, so many areas are completely different from each other. Um, and so many other Metroidvanias, like, have, like, shared art everywhere. But, like, we really went above and beyond to make, like, every area stand out on its own um, for the most part. Uh, I think, like, the only ones that kind of share a tile set are the sewers, this one, and a few other caves in a few other areas, but, I mean, Guyan's Cradle, Chamber of Migration, Ilnoth, you know, Afterlife, like, all of those are completely, completely separate ideas, and I think a lot of players just don't realize how much effort that is <laughs> when a lot of games just, like, you know do a lot with reusing assets, you know? Uh, so many games come to mind that I will just not mention any bit. I don't think it makes the game bad or worse, unless you're really reusing assets constantly to the point where it's noticeable. Most people don't notice it. I feel like I notice it right away in most games, which is why I made Death's Gambit this way, and why there's so many unique bosses with so many unique animations, like that's just something I really care about. I was sitting there alone with my thoughts, when I saw a shadow descend from the heavens. It was finally my black. I, I will I will just skip this dialogue. <laughs> but we absolutely love this character. Uh recording the voices were was was absolutely hilarious. Like recording the voices for this specifically. Uh, Kusif, I believe, is... We, we created this boss before we created the name. Uh, Kusif just happened to be a a god of death uh, under a certain mythology um, that uh, that is like a green dog. And so 
when we figured that out, we were like, oh my god, that's perfect for this creature. Um, I believe for this creature, for this this horse dog thing, the inspiration was purely Shadow of the Colossus. Um, we wanted there to be a creature that made you feel bad because it kind of looked like a dog. For, like, it makes, makes you feel bad for killing it. So that is that is what we made <laughs> we made a giant dog horse thing that makes you feel bad for attacking it and is a shadow colossus inspired boss it turned out amazing uh specifically brian one of our animators on the on our game arted did did the main art i don't know who did the animations it might have been greg but the main art was definitely brian um he might have done the animations i can't recall but uh i don't know it just turned out incredible such an amazing job. We had to iterate on it so many times. There were like 10 different versions of this creature. Um, and it slowly got bigger and bigger. This boss was sort of similar to the Forgotten Guy in that uh, we realized that because this was a boss that was kind of a puzzle to solve, um, that it felt bad because most of the other bosses in the game were like hack and slash fights. And so if you get to these giant bosses that you have to climb and solve like a puzzle. And you're like, well, that was lame by comparison. So we changed them to be hack and slash style boss encounters. Um, but the original idea for this boss was that you would have to, that these these feet were actually collidable, the front feet, um, and that you would have to go under uh, his legs one by one and then get behind him and then climb his tail and then walk on his back and attack his neck. That was how you would deal damage to this boss originally. Um, and while you were on his back, he would cast like some lightning spells that you'd have to dodge while attacking his neck. Um, this is pretty boring to be quite frank. Um, it was, it was pretty bad and we could have made it work, but I feel like it felt, it felt like too much of like a different game. If this was, as I said, with the forgotten guy, if this was a purely shadow class style game where you climb bosses and they're all mostly puzzle fights, then it would have probably been okay. And I probably would have worked even harder to try and make this a puzzle encounter. But at a certain point, I was just like, we're trying to do something that kind of is working against the, the genre of the game. So let's just make it something you have to fight normally as opposed to a puzzle encounter. Um, but yeah, that was the original idea with the boss. There was also, I think, a weak point on his, on right here where his eyes are. Um, after you destroy like the thing on the neck, you'd have to go to his eyes and destroy that too. Um, yeah, it took a lot of iteration and a lot of, uh, testing different animations to figure out what attacks felt good. Um, at the end, I ended up just being like, okay, he's going to have like a, like an attack where he like sweeps his whole head across and then one where he stomps here and then stomps over there and then one where he kind of like stomps all his legs around quickly and um and he's gonna have some lightning spell uh that he casts with his eyes or whatever i don't know um that was that was basically what i ended up doing i apologize for how much flashing this this boss is so huge that when it flashes, it feels like the whole screen flashes away. We do have an option in the Optus menu to disable this flashing, though, in case uh, anyone has any issues with that. I feel like I'm a little bit over leveled for Kusuth right now. Ooh, that is not good. this specific attack where he like sweeps forward and does lightning on the ground i really love that attack love how he starts combining his abilities this entire environment of the background is very similar 
to the environment. It's very similar to the bridge at the beginning of Shadow of the Colossus, as you can see, where um, where the main character rides through this bridge to get to the land of the Colossi. So this area, Morro's Obs Observatory. Um, I would say we developed this area maybe six. Uh, it's one of one of the first areas we made, but not the first, the first batch, you know. And also, it didn't go through that much iteration. Um, specifically, the structure of the level um, didn't change that much. I think there was an idea. There was an idea that I had for making a middle portion to this tower that doesn't exist anymore. Right? What? Right? What, what, what exists right now is just the bottom and the top of the tower. But originally, there was a middle portion that was procedurally generated. It would be like Mulvro made like this maze of rooms that sort of rearrange in crazy ways if you die um and uh yeah we never got to do that um it seems very ambitious and it probably would have taken a lot of effort um but it was definitely something i remember about this that did not make the cut um that said what we did make here did not change a lot let's see Uh, we definitely wanted this area to just be like the first end game area. Like this is where sh where stuff gets <laughs> shit gets real. And all the enemies are huge. That that was the intention. It's just cool that you can encounter just like an enemy that was a boss before as just a regular enemy now. And he hits like a truck. A lot of people don't know about this secret passage here, actually. This room is so me. I wanted there to be like a patrolling enemy that you didn't want to aggro at the same time. Um, it was sort of, it's very inspired by how dungeons were designed in Burning Crusade World of Warcraft, where a lot of, uh, a lot of the dungeons were designed in such a way that where there were like a million enemies in one room and you only wanted to aggro like two of them at a time. And if you aggro more than two, you want to polymorph or CC crowd control, like the rest and so i wanted there to be like okay in the end game areas we're gonna have enemies patrolling and you don't want to fight more than one at a time um and this was what came of that idea yeah that could have been really ugly let's unequip this Start using that guy in blood, actually. Wow. Annihilated. I just love how much stronger I am right now than at the beginning of the game. That you get to just destroy a Drake Knight like that. Two Owl Kings is... <laughs> is crazy and if you're not quick then they'll spawn more yeah that, that was the idea with this area is i wanted there to be like a lot of really tricky situations now for Mulro, one of my favorite boss fights one of everyone's favorite boss fights um this boss did actually change quite a bit um originally it was just gonna have magic abilities it was not gonna have like the magic swords that he has right now um but his art really didn't go through much iteration we sort of knew what we wanted him to be right off the get-go he was a galaxy mage he was supposed to be one of the one of the hardest bosses in the game that um tested everything that you had learned so far um 
And I'm really glad that everyone loves this boss. I'm really glad that it turned out the way it did. And the heroic version of this boss also is a sight to behold. One of my favorite encounters in the entire game. Um, just so, <laughs> so, so complicated, yet so fun. Um, yeah, what a great encounter. Um, yeah, I originally had a few attacks where he would cast like this lightning that would like sort of transform um, and then you would have to stand between the lightnings, lightning uh, streams. I don't even know how to explain it. It's just like a lightning bolt that doesn't that like doesn't deal damage, and then suddenly flashes and deals damage. Um, and it would slowly like uh, change as it gets created, like change form. Um, but it wasn't. It was too slow and boring. Um, and um, he definitely always had the meteor attack idea. Um, but the idea would be would have been that he had. He would just mostly cast abilities, spell abilities, but it was really not that fun. Um, and at a certain point, we started adding melee attacks, and it felt really good. Um, really happy with how it turned out. I I believe this one attack is one of the only ones that uh, changed a lot. There was supposed to be a section. Uh, every every intermission between each phase was not supposed to be this rotating lightning thing. Every intermission was a completely different mini game. We we did try one where a Mulvera was huge and he would chase you across this platforming section. Um, and if you dig into the files, if you dig into the files of this game, you'll find the platforming section hidden somewhere in this room, at least where we tried. Um, I think it would have been cool, but uh, the boss is already complicated enough. Yeah, he was he was huge. He would chase you from the left to right, from left to right, and he had like some lightning attack that it, would like basically kill you kill you instantly if you uh didn't go fast enough to the right side of the screen. Oh god, this is not good boys. Oh oh boy. Oh no. Oh okay. <laughs> that, was, that was bad. Oh I did not mean to do that. Heal There we go. I love the music. I love that it's an evolution of the of the music and the in the level play motif they are good every game should have them Oh no. Oh my god. Oh, okay. Survived it. Wow. This came down to the wire. How, how is this possible? All right. Well, I'm going to do Obsidian Veil vale just so I can talk about it a little bit, but it is optional. Um, Alex disagrees with me with this. Alex wished this area was not optional. Or at least um, enjoys the area way more than me. Um, I think it, it was controversial that we put this area so on the side. Um, but part of the reason I decided to put it so far away and optional is because I'm not particularly, pr particularly proud of this area. I think it was one of the first we made. So it's a little bit scrappy and... Um, it's, just, it's just a little... I don't know not my favorite that said 
that this enemy is fantastic and I'm really proud about how how he turned out. Really fun to fight. I like that you can see uh Karen being reborn in the background. This was the first enemy that we made that made it into the final prod product. Um, there was another enemy. There was like a first enemy that I actually made that was like really bad. <laughs> um, that uh, that didn't make it into the final project. Um, maybe one day I'll stream that version of the game just to show what it looks like. I probably should do that. I think it'd be a lot of fun. These shamans, these wolf shamans were like the second enemy we ever made for the game. And Karen, the boss of this area, was the third enemy we ever made for this game. Besides, actually, no. The ice hearts. The floating ice hearts in the hub were also some of the first enemies we ever made for this game. And There was like an ice elemental um, enemy that would like stomp on the ground and create like ice... I spikes um and that didn't make it to the final game but that was an enemy that was in this area originally it was pretty bad like i animated it and i'm not an animator it was not amazing but he would basically spawn he would create the ice hearts um and i didn't like the enemy but i did like the ice heart idea so the ice hearts made it into the final game <laughs> and those floating ice hearts were my art, I believe. Yeah, these these little guys. Um, these these enemies that are like a rotating hoop uh, came about because we were making the abilities for Zyra Lotep. Or actually, no. Um, we were making so we were making abilities for Amolvoro. Um, and one of the ideas that I had for it was was some three D hoop attack. Um, that he would use during one of his intermissions. It didn't really work out that well, but we used the code to make that enemy and to also make an enemy in uh, uh, the Chamber of Migration that are like a, a cluster of like air drones. Um, but regardless, um, that attack idea did make it into the into Afterlife because when we made Zyra Lotep, the secret boss, um, he does have a 3D attack that is effectively what we wanted to do for him overall. Um, he has like that attack where it's like the 3D orbs, um, 3D orb, hoops that you have to go through to survive the ice giants uh this the story behind that encounter is is interesting um when we were first creating this game uh when it was still only ranged weapons we were trying to think of how to make this game better and we wanted to add um climbable giant bosses i didn't particularly know how to do that. I was still a very beginner programmer, but I didn't want to say no to myself. I wanted to just see and try whatever. Uh, just I just wanted to do stuff that I thought was cool, and if it worked out, it worked out. And I had spent my sophomore year uh, watching a lot of Attack on Titan, like season one and two, and I don't know. I guess I just got really inspired listening to its soundtrack and I was like what if we just add like a giant monster that you climb like attack on titan style like you you just grapple onto it and you attack it um and uh visually it was stunning but we could never get it to be that fun it would have like it had like little weak points um that you would attack as you like hook around it but um but it wasn't very fun and it and the code for it was really bad because I was a beginner programmer. It was it barely worked at all, like to the point where like we didn't have an animation system for the giant. It was just like a bunch of pieces that moved around the screen. Um and they weren't even that synced together. So like if you play the boss a long for a long time, the, the pieces of the boss would animate at incorrect times to the point where like limbs would just be flying around. Um it was terrible. It was honestly not amazing and i think um we got that boss that original iteration of the boss done um and you would have to climb it go inside a cave inside it fight some wolves inside the caves inside him and then leave uh and then get to the top it, it, that version of it is sort of in the game 
Um, but it was, it, it also had like the grappling hook mechanic. And um, the moment I realized that it was not very good and that we shouldn't <laughs> ship it as one of the first, as, as like a main thing you had to do in the game was when we brought it to an event here in LA where we, we brought the game to be shown off at like a Sony event. Um, and we had like, we, you had the ability to play through the Alduin area or play through this ice giant demo. And most people picked Alduin, but one person picked the ice giant and they played through it and thought it was so bad that they didn't even, that like, they just looked, I just remember them looking like bored and like upset with the game after they played the ice giant. So that experience was so, so bad. That I was just like, let's not let anyone else play test that or, or play that at, the, at this event. Let's just um, let's just let them play the Alduin area. And uh, after we talked about it, we were like, yeah, I think the Ice Giant's just not very good. <laughs> we would have to completely rework this encounter to be good. So for for the time being, uh, we just decided it was a cut encounter um but uh eventually when we learned that spine animation works really well with game maker we did reanimate the ice giant in spine and made it a real thing and it is in the game um it's in an optional area um but uh we had to completely redo it to be fun um i wish i wish at the time it was a good enough programmer to program it to make it a better boss fight but it was just not the case um I think this entire game was a massive learning process for me, and I apologize if uh, if uh, if you saw that ice giant and you wished it was in the final project, and it was really cool. It it is in the final project. This is not anything mind blowing. It just it's just something cool that is in here in the game. I almost think a better solution, a better thing would have been to never even talk about this ice giant and just put it in the game and have players find it. And I think that would have been cooler. Because players would have probably then thought that, like, players probably made their imaginations go wild when they saw it in the trailer, as opposed to... Uh, it makes your imagination go wild um, when you see it in a trailer. If it had just been something you find secretly, like, in an optional area of this game, then it probably would have felt much better. And you would have just been like, okay, I guess it's just, like, a cool thing that you see, that you find. It's not, like, a boss fight or anything. Um... Let us progress. I will talk about Zarahelotep after this area. Um, because, in my opinion, it's one of my favorite things in this entire game. Just, I I knew I wanted there to be, like, a underlying secret quest line that was, like, going to take a long time to figure out. And even after you figured it out, like, it takes forever to to do it again if you... Like, it takes a long time to do it, even after you know what to do. Um, and it would take you through these, like, hidden... What felt like he hidden dev areas. Um, that were really creepy. Uh, inspired by Yumaniki. Um, Yumaniki was the main inspiration for that area. Oh. This is the ice element I was talking about. I forgot that we didn't cut it. This, this is the... This is the only K this is the only time you encounter this ice elemental and um that was one of the first enemies in the entire game that we made. Sometimes we just put things in the game that just feel like why is there why is it the only case why is it the only ice elemental in this entire game? Like why is it there? And it's just because I didn't want to cut it. I just left it in. Because it was okay enough. But I didn't like it enough to put it again anywhere else, <laughs> so. It is what it is. I feel like there is something good in this treasure chest. That is something really good. That is... That is what you need if you're going to fight Heroic Endless. I think a lot of people don't know this, but a lot of Heroic Endless's debuffs can be removed with that medicinal plume that you get right there.
So yeah, this is the first boss we ever made for this entire game. I'm really glad that this platform interacts with this crackdown. Um, because I knew I wanted there to be... Whoa. I knew I wanted there to be more bosses, more boss interactions with the crashdown ability. And this is one where it felt natural. Like, it felt like, of course, the crashdown should work here on this platform. If it doesn't, I think people would have been upset, honestly. One of the main ideas of this encounter was that there was a sort of like damage raise aspect to it uh, with these ice blocks. That that I always knew I wanted that to be a thing with this boss encounter. And I'm glad that it worked out and it's in the final version of this boss. I don't know if I would make a lot of damage race encounters in a future game because I've learned that people really don't like them. <laughs> But I'm glad I got to do it on this one. That said, I still like them. I still think it's cool. And when I played Final Fantasy 16, I, I found it hilarious that some of the bosses have those damage race aspects. Though that said, in that game, they're always super easy. I don't think I ever failed them. And if ever. The, the damage checks or whatever. Oh. Missed my ability. Yeah, I pretty much I, I I think like pretty much everyone uh disagrees with me with the damage race stuff. Like I I think it's cool. I think like the idea that you have to learn how to beat a boss really quickly is really fun. Like I think it's fun to like learn how to improve your character and and fight a boss in a faster like fight fighting a boss faster is always fun to me or learning how to fight it faster is always fun but uh i understand that it is not for everyone not everyone enjoys that Oh no! Oh my god, that was so close. <laughs> Not gonna lie, I feel like that melee attack from Tundra Lord shouldn't have hit me. But I blame the fact that this is a very... <laughs> that is a very old animation. That is, that is something we definitely could have improved right there. All right. That is Tundra Lord. I don't think I've died in this entire playthrough yet. All right, so let's talk about Zara Lotep while I'm getting to Ilnoth um, and the rest of the Exiled Hand or the Eldritch Hand. Um, they are they are five exiled gods, exiled old gods um, that sort of plot behind the scenes in the story of Death's Gambit Afterlife. Um, and I think just a lot of people don't, don't realize that they are fairly similar to the God Hand in Berserk. That was definitely planned it was definitely something i felt that was cool um i wish basically my thought process was i wish I, I wanted the villains to be like a eldritch god version of the god hand in berserk and so um once you make that correlation in your head you start to a lot of things start to make sense i hopefully i hope 
I hope that is the case. Um, and I'm sure that also makes you think, who is the fifth old god? Um, I I obviously will not be going into that. I think that's that's something that would probably be something we talk about in a sequel if we ever make one. But um, the rest are in the game. Um, the rest of the hand is in the game. It's uh, Thalmas, Xyarlotep, Nier, Ash. Um, basically, every one of the Ashes of Vados boss encounter um, plus that fifth one. Um, which I believe I meant... So, so I believe I mentioned earlier in this video that um, that the whole Ashes of Vados idea was what I would have done for a sequel. Um, so I knew that in that sequel, the final boss encounter would have been uh, would have probably been the whole Eldritch Hand. Um, because how could you follow up fighting Thalamus but by following with a fight where you fight them all. Um, but um, but yeah, obviously they are, they are not defeated at all in, in any way, shape, or form. So um, if there were a sequel, um, that's something that we would go into. Um, Zyarlotep, um, definitely very similar to a different old uh, eldritch god of hp lovecraft i forget the name the full name i think it's near hello top or something like that the name of the eldritch god that he's inspired by um it's still very different uh than the actual god that it's inspired by um it just it just shares a name that is similar <laughs> they're not at all the same I don't think anyone's realized this, but the Endless here in the sewers hits actually a little harder than the one in Immortal Citadel. <laughs> Not a lot harder, but just a little much harder. Like, a little bit harder. I wanted this boss encounter against Endless to feel like a quick but brutal showdown where, like, either of you could go down quickly. Um, so I'm really happy with how it turned out here. I'm going to skip through. I'm so glad that we got to make another boss with like sad music. It is my favorite thing ever. So, Corpse City of Ilna, uh, this is another, it's a rendition on the idea of, of Ryla, the sunken city in, where, where Cthulhu resides in H.P. Lovecraft, but, um, but yeah, the, the idea is that everyone here has been trapped in this nightmare for centuries effectively effectively living the rest of their immortal lives tortured and uh, and tormented by Thalamus because he feeds off that energy For those who don't know, there is actually a secret area this way. I, I guess I forgot about... I forgot to go that way, but... Once you land on the hand, you can actually jump to the right and you will find an area with some nice items. Um... I wish I remembered what, song, what, what inspired the music here, but I just knew I wanted it to be... Have this, like sad creepy energy i wanted to just be confusing and weird 
Ah, uh, yes, the best shield in the game. Ilnoth changed a little. As I mentioned on Sky Tomb, there originally was an enemy that would chase you around. Um, and they were invincible. These jellyfish were originally going to deal damage, and, and these little... You would have to go between them to not take damage, but it was just a little annoying because they sort of look like they shouldn't deal damage, you know? So we just made them not deal damage. But they were originally supposed to be an enemy, which is why there are jellyfish you can fight during the Omovoro boss encounter. Um, these enemies are called siphonophores, and they're inspired by the true the animal called a siphonophore. I highly recommend you look that up on YouTube. They are terrifying uh, beasts of the depths of of our of our oceans. Um, they're like a colony of like parasites or something. I don't know. They're like a colony of worms or something. And they sort of look like that, um, except they don't whip you. It's great to fight these with the turtle shield because you sort of don't know in what direction they hit you. Um, but because the the Siphonophore is effectively like a jellyfish. That is why they, they emit lightning. I I don't think they used to say those, or I don't think they had voiceovers in the original That's Gambit. I hope it's fairly obvious what's going on here. And that is that they are constantly being reborn. Even if they kill themselves, they would be reborn. Thomas is quite a mean god, to say the least. <laughs> he is very cruel. He's cruel and, and indifferent to mortals. All right, so I just wanted to take a second to go through um some concept art um this was the only these are some of the only concept art uh pictures that exist for anguis the dragon that was supposed to be in the mortal citadel we really didn't get anywhere with it um as you can see with this one i bring it i make it bigger it kind of has a similar silhouette to near um which uh i don't know i just think it's cool that we managed to reuse that a little but um yeah, it would have been cool to make a Dragon Boss, for sure. It was just uh, way out of our comfort zone. Uh, it would have taken a long time. I didn't really know how to approach that, so we didn't do it. Um, and I want to show a few other things that didn't make it into the final game. This area in uh, that would have been a part of the hub, which, as I was looking through the files, I remembered that the Central Sanctuary was originally called the Blightlands, um, there was no real reason why it was called that. I just thought it was a cool name for the central area of the game. So we changed it later. That's why it's not called that anymore. But there was, there were these little rocks in the middle that would lead to this pond. And you could sort of interact with something next to the, where those rocks are leading to the pond. And you would go to the area afterwards and fight the death elemental in the background. But there was really nothing more to this area. It just We just thought it was a cool idea and we, we made it. There's nothing else to the lore of this we sort of just knew that the central sanctuary would have a lot of the souls of people that have died uh trapped in it and so i i feel like that was what why we we created this like death element over here that was like sort of a representation of of the dead of seradon um but we never made it there it's a little bit um not as refined as the rest of are in the game uh yeah and then i th so this area is the uh the middle citadel area that we unfortunately cut that had the gaian chained up um again was originally called gar or bar the destroyer or something like that that was supposed to be a boss he would like unchain his hands and smash you but we never finished that or we never we we decided not to do it <laughs> Because, again, the Immortal Citadel was supposed to be way bigger and was supposed to be the main area of the game. Like, most of the game would take place within it. And we changed that because we wanted, uh, we wanted more variety. 
Um, and then here's another shot from the White Lands, from what it looked like sort of originally. Uh, art, the art looks a little bit more flat, as you can see. It's cool though. I think it still looks very pretty. So, anyways, here's here's the. Whoa, that's not it. Let me zoom out. As you can see, I even put the expected boss order at the top of this giant map that I'm trying to zoom in. I believe it says the Guy's Cradle had forgotten Guy as the first boss, born in Sanctum. That's another name for the Central Sanctuary, I guess. Then you would go to Obsidian Plateau, fight the Tundra Lord, then go to Alduin Slums, fight the boss, the Sniper Boss. Then go to Alduin City, fight the Phoenix Rider. Then you send Eldritch Council, fight Serge Thalmus, Mulvaro, uh, Citadel. Then you would, in the Citadel, you would fight the Dark Knight, and then the final boss. This is, this is um, probably halfway through development. This was the intended boss order. Yeah, I guess for a while the Dark Knight was in the Citadel. That definitely changed after a certain point. The Dark Knight moved a lot. It moved a lot from locations. Um, but what's cool about this is... Let me actually zoom in a little bit more. What's cool about this is you can see some of the original structures for the game. Gaian's Cradle, as I mentioned before, was a lot more linear. Um... You would, this would be the beginning of the game right here on the left side right now. You would leave your horse where these other blue horses are on the left side and then you would go right and um, I believe this is the area that we had people play at many, uh, at many events including packs. Um, you would fight the Moss Knight. I believe the Moss Knight was optional here I guess. Uh, he would guard like a treasure chest and then later you would fight like a Shade Knight from Alduin in this like empty hollowed out tower and then fight the forgotten guy in afterwards um let me zoom even more apologies for how silly the, this is this is, i'm doing this all in obs and it does not have the best ui i don't know how to zoom in without without some shenanigans you see that so anyways there's this area here below the forgotten guy and that we cut um that was really cool looking it was like a giant elk face with like an NPC below it that was like a daughter of Gaia. I believe the, the daughter of Gaia NPC is actually in the game. Uh, and she appears if you defeat Kusif and you want to refight Kusif, she appears. Um, but I believe it was going to be an NPC. I, I don't remember what the idea for that NPC was. Um, but it would sort of connect in, through two different routes to the Central Sanctuary. Um, the Central Sanctuary here had a very different setup was sort of smaller but had like this underground cave system um that honestly looked really cool and it would lead to guarded tomb on the right side here um alduin had like two levels to it um i had like the alduin top area and then like the slums underneath um that changed quite a bit um sort of because it doesn't make any sense really visually <laughs> um but uh but yeah yeah there was originally the church would be in the slums and that was like a secondary path to the upper path where you would go through some ramparts and fight the phoenix rider up here um yeah all that all that got cut that said that area was not amazing um it was i believe the third area we ever made besides the obsidian veil which speaking of the way you would get to it would be like you would take some elevator up or you would climb up the tower in the central sanctuary and then Either go left to Mulvaro's Observatory or right to Obsidian Vale. Um, and this is what it looked like. It was very different. Very, very different. Um, this just gives me, honestly, a little bit of PTSD. Because it reminds me of how stressed I was trying to make such an enormous game on my own. Um, here is here is what the Alduin Sewers looked like before. They got cut from the original Death's Gambit, but then we added a new Sewers uh added new sewers to um to the new to afterlife um and uh yeah that was that was awesome i'm glad that, that the sewers turned out the way they did in the in afterlife um through the sewers you would get to uh you would get to journey's end um i think there would be more slums here um journey's end had a lot of hook points all those circles are hook points as you can see here back when the hook shot was a thing and then past this point, there wasn't really a lot that connected everything. 
Citadel had a very different structure. Wow, so much changed. It's actually insane. Making games is a lot of work, guys. It's a lot of work. Oh my god. It's a lot of work. Guard the tomb. You would get through it through the central through the central sanctuary. It was so different as well, as you can see. It still led to uh to Journey's End in some way, I believe. Actually, yeah, I would it would lead to the entrance of Journey's End. Maybe I I, I don't fully remember what the structure was, but that was the entire game at the time. Anyways, I just want to show that for a little bit. I just thought it was cool. I, oh, actually, ooh, I am missing something. I believe Elnoth is on the bottom right here. This is the original setup. Um, well, not the original. We just had many different setups for Elnoth. We just constantly changed it. I guess like in this version, you would go down and go left or go right. Um, and then once you completed both, something would happen and you would fight Thalmas, but um, but as you can see, it, the actual Ilnoth didn't really change too much. It's just the order of things kind of moved around. Which is kind of how most of the game changed. It's just we just moved around a lot of stuff. There are some things that got lost in the process, but uh, I like to think that most of it was not amazing. <laughs> so they got cut for a reason. Um, all right, cool. Well, that's... that's um, all the concept art and pictures I want to show for the time being. Okay, I am back. Let's finish up Elnoth and fight Thalmas. I spent some time just going through old documents and uh, came up with a few more things that I hadn't mentioned uh, about certain characters. Like, for example, Thalmas was originally the original name we had for him was. Uh, Bol Garad, like B O L Garad. I'm, I don't know. It, I believe there was no real significance to that name. I'm pretty sure I just came up with it one day. Um, and I wanted, I felt like with a character as cool as Thalmas, it deserved a better name. Uh, and I, and yeah, I mean, I feel like the, the name is self explanatory. Uh, Thalmas is a part of. Of everyone's brains um, I will keep it as vague as possible by not <laughs> elaborating any further on that explanation but uh, another character that changed names was Ioni uh, her name well her character was just this person in suit of and originally Ioni was just the art of someone that was cool. Like I believe Alex like arted up a bunch of cool knights that could be NPCs, and we we loved we both loved the armor for this orange knight that ended up becoming Ioni. Originally, uh, Ioni was called Lionel, Lionel like a lion, um, and eventually we changed the name to Ioni, um, which is fitting because. Ioni is in the name Lionel, but, uh, but yeah, uh, that was another name that changed. Um, I believe Endless didn't even have a name until the end, until the very end of Death's Gambit development. We kept changing her name, um, and eventually I came up with Endless and Alex came up with Everly, um, for her human name, um, which are both fantastic. I... <laughs> I think both names are very fitting. I The main most important thing with the final boss, uh, with the design of a final boss, in my opinion, is that it needs to uh, be very important to the story of the game, and it needs to be emotional. I think if it is emotional, then it, it's fitting as a final boss. And in that sense, uh, we knew that we wanted that out of Endless. So... We knew one way to do that was to make Endless a uh, family member. <laughs> um, whether that be your mom or your sister. And at the beginning, Endless was supposed to be your sister. But then I ended up making 
Everly your mom because not everyone has a sister, but everyone has a mom, and we thought that was more relatable. Um, this is the part of the game where I wanted uh, things to get scary, I guess. I, I'm gonna skip through it, but I love this part. It was very fun to make. Also, one of my favorite bosses in the entire game. I mentioned this before, but the music for this fight uh, was... we For the music of this fight, we looked at a lot at the Mad Max Fury Road soundtrack. Uh, and as for the mechanics, uh, I'm. I just came up with them, thinking of uh, what a creepy pasta boss would would do. <laughs> um, it's not, as I mentioned this before in this playthrough, but it was not at all inspired by Flowey from the from Undertale, since we were designing this boss before Undertale even had even released. So I just want to <laughs> make that doubly clear. This was more of anything inspired by Psycho Mantis from Metal Gear Solid One. The animations for Thalmas took a very long time. It took Brian like two and a half months. A lot of iteration on the face. We just knew that the face needed to be like a jump scare. We needed the face to be scary, but not like to to a point where like you can't like anyone. I don't know. He's he could have been scarier, but we just tried to make it a little bit cool so that staring at this boss isn't a pure, you know. So it's not just an annoying fight where you're forced to stare at a creepy face the entire time. Even though it sort of is that. It's just... I guess what I'm saying is it could have been worse. <laughs> and I'm really glad we stuck with this version because he's cool. In terms of the way he looks... Um, I, I would say we we googled one of the most hilarious moments of development was was us trying to decide what the scary face for Thalmus should be and we googled scary face on Google and Alex and I were so were so horrified by the results that we immediately like screamed like ah oh, okay stop um switch switch the page we definitely didn't want this to be a very hard fight um because we knew it'd be annoying to have to retry completely from the beginning. I I actually so another another inspiration for for this boss was Gygas from Earthbound. I think I I forgot to mention that one, but that is such a cool boss. If you haven't seen Gygas from Earthbound, it's the original jump scare boss that a lot of other indie games have tried to emulate. I think a lot. Uh, I do like the character of Ash. I think there's a lot of untold. There's the the story behind Ash is is a lot deeper than we go, uh, than 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 what we say in the game. Uh, I will not go into it because if if there is more content for this game, I'd love to go into it. Um, but you can sort of get an idea of what his backstory is just from this scene. I can't deny that uh, Ash is definitely a very edgy anime villain character. Ash was a character that we wanted to do from the very beginning, but 
We never really felt like we could do it justice in the original game. And, like, the story kind of didn't really... It kind of didn't didn't fit with the rest of the game at that point. We would have needed to do way more content. So one of the things we wanted to do with this expansion was to add that story back in. So I've, I've talked a lot already about Immortal Citadel before, but uh, at least Kershorai, sorry. I've in, it's the development name for Kershorai is Immortal Citadel. <laughs> this area changes a lot as well. I mean, originally it was going to be massive it was only going to have gigantic uh, en enemy encounters like every enemy here was supposed to be a giant or a guy or something to that effect um and it's supposed to be the hardest thing ever but and it was going to have like five bosses or six bosses in it um but uh yeah we we decided to do more continent and add more areas as opposed to making this one area big I think you can hear a little bit of Final Fantasy in this song. Um, I don't think that was inspiration, but I know Kyle likes Final Fantasy. I'm just going to proceed to the main route. This playthrough is enormous. This video is enormous, so... If it gets enough views or if there's enough uh, engagement from people on Discord, I will... Or on Twitter, I will I will make a full playthrough if everyone wants. Um, feel free to post about that if you really want to watch a full playthrough. But for now, I'll just get to endless because uh, uh, this is taking me a while, and it's gonna take a long while to edit as well. <laughs> it's a lot longer than people think uh, to edit this sort this sort of thing. I apologize if some of it has been rambly. Uh, I just hope that you at least got some cool info out of it and that uh that you enjoyed the playthrough i guess oh my god this part is hard i forgot and i don't have the slide oof that is not good let me heal let's get him guess i'm gonna have to do it the old-fashioned way without a slide if you have done a speedrun, you will know that there is a secret invisible block here, invisible wall that uh, teleports you to a secret cutscene. Um, <laughs> just for speedrunners. I highly recommend you look up that Scambit speedrunner cutscene if you haven't seen it. It basically triggers if you haven't defeated uh, some certain major bosses and you have arrived here under a certain amount of time. I believe it's under two hours. Perfect. We have a plus seven weapon. That's all I really want for this encounter. Do I have anything else? I mean, just because I want to be doing my first try, I'm going to equip this. <laughs> but hopefully I don't have to use it. This boss. Um, endless. Um... One hilarious tidbit about this boss is that in Heroic, it was even harder, and I mentioned that in this playthrough before. But what made it harder was that there were bullet hell elements in the boss. It was basically the same as it was right now, but whenever she, like, teleported or created, like, little portals, she would also exp she would also create, like, rings of bullets that you also had to dodge at the same time. Um, it was really unfun, actually, and I don't know why what was going on in my head. I mean, we could have added better bullet patterns now that I'm looking at it, or now that I'm thinking about it, but at the time, I... I was just trying to create <laughs> the hardest boss in the game and I and I pushed it a little bit too far so I removed those um and I added an extra phase originally it was just like four phases but then I added an extra phase where um where after you've beaten all the darkness or the like the the fear sadness and fury phases or, or all the three phases then after you defeat them then uh she has one final phase um and that was also potentially even harder the final phase too I had to like tone it down a little she had way more health and her sword became twice as big. I'm not joking. <laughs> in her final phase, her, her sword would become even bigger. Um, and it would cover, like, the entire screen, effectively. Uh, and we removed that because it was just too much. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the source of immortality, we never... We didn't know what visually how it would represent 
how to represent it. Um, so we struggled a lot figuring out what it was, and it ended up becoming this orb, this this Pokeball looking thing. Um, Alex, Alex has a lot of lore for what this room is supposed to be. I mean, I believe those were supposed to be like blood vials in the background. Uh, these are, there's like magisters in the background as well. They represent the magisters before they were even in the game because they weren't in the game before. And we knew that we wanted to, in, in Afterlife, one of the other things that we knew we wanted to do was go deeper into what the magisters were. And that's what, um, that's why we added the ma uh, like the magisters in the magisters labyrinth. This song rules. I just didn't want to sh use the turtle shield for this fight. Um, but I have the talent that increases uh, the rating of all shields to S rank, so it doesn't really matter what I equip. Actually, it does. I have better shields. <laughs> they have other effects, but I'll just do this fight with this shield. This has been mentioned before, but before uh, this encounter, uh, originally you would have fought... We, we had an idea where you would fight Endless while on horseback, once again, like at the beginning of the game. But after that, after that, if we removed that from the intro where you would fight on horseback, we decided not to add that. Oh god. This is not my best ever or endless uh, attempt by any means. I feel like usually I'm done with this phase by now. Your mother's life was forfeit the moment she left for the expedition. What you see before you is a woman sustained. I will take this moment to mention uh, that for this final battle, we I knew I wanted to do something crazy, something that had never been done before. Um, and I wanted the solution to beating the boss be that you had to cancel your contract and fight the boss as a mortal. Uh, but I could never figure out how to make that work lore-wise. Um, and on top of that, I felt like it was too mean to, to potentially lose your save file. Um, so we didn't do it, um, but I really regret not doing it. Um, what's insane is that anyways, Nier Automata did it like a year before we released or like two years before we released. So it kind of felt like, oh, well, someone else beat us to the idea. It's, it's just kind of crazy how much like in game development, people beat each other to a certain idea. And well, like everyone, a lot of people have a lot of great designers have the same idea in mind but only some of them get to do it first and only some of them get to execute it in the right way i mean i'll, I'll be damned i don't think i would have executed it as well as near did it so kudos to them <laughs> but that
That was a plan. That was part of the plan. Only those who are at my door can see me. You've been an absent guest for the past several years. It's time you and leave this mortal realm. Ah, the dark phase that everyone hates. The the thing about this phase is if you parry her and if you perfect block her, a lot of times you can actually hit the orbs at the same time. Like that. Oh my god. This is gonna be this is gonna come down to the wire. Oh oh my god, that was so lucky. I would not have survived that if I if I didn't add that feature. So there's a feature in the game where if you're holding down block in the middle of a t if in the middle of an attack, it will actually skip the animation, the end of the animation, and it will make you block. Um, there's a lot of stuff like that in the game that people don't kind of realize or, or notice until maybe playing the game for a long time. But it's just our way of making the game feel more, feel better and more fluid. Like, you can use abilities near the end of your animations and it will instantly cancel the previous animation. Um, there's a lot of animation canceling in this game. Alright, well... I have a Leaf of Gaia, if it comes down to it. Popping cooldowns. Let's do this. That is not the attack you want to see. <laughs> this is the attack you want to see. It is done. And I didn't even have to use a leaf. Um I don't know if I'll cut this part. Um, but I'll just talk about it right now. While I was developing this game, I, I I burned out at a certain point and I got very like, I changed a lot as a person throughout the development. I mean, this was seven years, eight years, anyone changes in that period of time. And uh, not gonna lie at a certain point, I got really frustrated with the fact that I was still making this game and that this is the game that represents me as a person. And it was kind of frustrating because I, by the end of the development, I don't feel like that scam represented me as a person at all. Um, it represented who I was maybe when I was 18, when I started thinking about the game, but, uh, but it's just weird. I don't know why I'm bringing this up, but it's just the reality about game development, um, and making games when you're so young, um, especially after I changed so much, I changed so much as a human being, uh, during the development of this game. Um, so it's just crazy to think that like, I part of the reason why I wanted to make another game right away after this one was because I wanted uh, to do something that represented me at, at that moment, or I guess right now, um, something very different, um, whatever that may be. <laughs> but I was very tired with the dark fantasy uh, themes when I finished that Gambit for sure. And the gloom and doom of this game, I... I absolutely wanted to make a happy game afterwards. That said, all the all the things that I started coming up with after finishing that scambit weren't that happy either. <laughs> but uh but they at least represented me better. Um uh so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. It's hard to explain my feelings about it, but um but I I guess I guess the best way to explain it is just by saying that like everyone changes. And when I started making this game, I wanted to make that scambit. And by the end, I wanted to make very different things that uh, that were so different. And uh, by the end, it was not making me happy uh, to, to make a game like this with these themes, with these characters. Specifically, yeah, specifically themes and characters that uh, that I felt like I enjoyed more when I was younger. And I feel like the characters and themes and stories that I like now are so different. Uh, so... I guess we'll see what the future holds. Uh, hilariously, I do think, I do think uh, my work in Deltarune represents me better 
uh, with who I am today, uh, for better or for worse, whatever, whatever you think of Delta and Undertale, I think it does, which is why I enjoy working on it. Uh, so let's finish this boss. Let's finish this playthrough. And I think it's important to say that I have an amazing relationship with my family and my mom and my dad. Uh, and I think a lot of people playing this game might be like, huh, I wonder what they went through when they were younger. And I got to be clear, I did not go through any bad family <laughs> situations. Uh, so, so to some extent, I feel like... To some, extent, to some extent, I feel like this story didn't feel like mine to tell. But it just sort of happened to to become this way as we developed it the story changed a lot and and certain characters became what they were because we needed them to be a certain way in order for the story to make sense um making a story about immortals is really is really annoying and complicated um turns out it creates a lot of plot holes and, and problems um and after a certain point when while we were developing the story we were more trying to tie loose ends and fill plot holes as opposed to making the story that we wanted to tell. Sorry. Please. Don't make the same mistakes I did. I may not have been there for you in life, but I will always be with you in death. So, live. And with that, we end this playthrough of Death's Gambit. I will not go to the credits in case I want to use this save uh, to proceed to uh, ending A or ending B. Um, thank you so much for watching this playthrough uh, all the way to the end. That's that's just insane to me. Because it's <laughs> looking at the timer, I'm pretty sure it's going to be really long. Um, but I'm also, thank you so much for playing the game if you have. So thank you so much for still being interested after two years of of that's gambit afterlife and four years i believe of the original that's gambit release um a lot has happened since then um alex and i are still working on games um we will you will know about them on our discord if we ever uh announce them um and uh yeah um i hope you all enjoyed learning everything about all these development stories and uh Happy Death's Gambit Afterlife anniversary. Um, I will definitely be doing a couple more playthroughs afterwards. I, regardless of what views this this video gets, um, I will be making a playthrough for Undertale, um, and I will be making a few. Uh, afterwards, I will be making short videos with some. They'll probably be about game design. Um, they'll probably be short game design videos. So, uh, I guess stay tuned for that. And if anything, if you haven't followed me on Twitter, uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter. Um, anyways, thank you so much, everyone. Goodbye.